and welcome back to MD Global Muscle here at the On The Rise Media Studio with me, your host, Giles Thomas, and we are joined all the way from California. <laughs> Is that correct? Yes, sir. Brad Rowe! No, no, like... <laughs> I was just thinking, is that right? That's correct, isn't it? Yeah, you, you, you live in California, isn't it? <laughs> How you doing, Giles? Pleasure. To th thank you for having me on here. I'm really good, mate. Really good. Good to get you on. I think we've um, we've been uh, I've, I've been because sp I speak to you mainly on the forum, on the MD forum, um, for a good right. few years. But um, yeah, it's good to finally get you on the show, mate. Because um, we, I tried to get you a few months ago, but I think we were we couldn't we couldn't connect. So um, yeah, thank you for joining us, Brad. And um, yeah, welcome to Global Muscle. How are you doing? I'm doing uh, pretty fantastic. Life's been pretty good to me. Mm. So, you know, I can't complain at all. Got a lot of good things running down the pipeline. Mm -hmm. So it's, uh, it's, been, it's been an interesting, you know, Corona's been good for me in a way and, and bad in other ways, and we can touch base upon that. But mm -hmm. uh, life is very good. Good. So, I mean, I think, because obviously you're an IFBB pro, you, you compete in the open class. Um, you work at, obviously, Gold's Gym, don't you work out there? Do, do you want to tell us a bit about what you do outside of pro bodybuilding? Uh, so I was an independent trainer at Gold's Gym Venice for the past eight years. And I'm sure a lot of you guys have seen, if you follow me at all, this crazy device that I have, <laughs> which is just right here next to me. Yep. Uh, that is the, the new fit is a, it is a neurological stimulator. So it doesn't, it's not like the complex machines or anything like that, that forcibly causes a muscle contraction. Mm -hmm. This actually enhances your own neurological function. It sends a signal that mimics your body's nervous system signal. Oh. So it's meant as a therapeutic device. Okay. It's a $20,000 piece of equipment. So if you have an injury, say your shoulders fucked up. Yeah. I have a scanning pad that I scan around and we find neurological impedances, things where mechanoreceptors aren't firing efficiently, or there may be some nerve damage in the area. And as I go over those areas, all of a sudden your body needs to try to protect itself and it becomes a sharp shooting pain. And that tells us exactly where the issues are. Mm. We pad up those hot spots, we call them the neurological deficiencies, send signal through there and through series of treatment, we actually reprogram the nervous system to fire more efficiently, mm -hmm. doing away with the root cause of the injury. And on top of that, the signal that we send is eliciting a lengthening of tissue. So like the compacts and other stim machines, they shorten tissue and it, it affects the motor firing unit. So all it does is just forcibly contract with without your you trying to do so. And that can damage tissue even more. We're actually sending a si signal that tells tissue to relax and release, which opens you up, increases blood flow and nutrient flow to the area. So you're recovering from injury about 40 to 60% faster. And then as you guys have seen, like what I do with Dexter Jackson with his legs. Yeah. Yes. Different through different frequencies, yeah. we actually uh, while you train, it enhances your own body's signal, so it gives you the ninety to ninety-five percent muscle fiber recruitment. So someone like Dexter, who's older, neurologically you begin to lose function. You know, you start to have spinal issues and, and nerve issues. So we were getting Dexter to fire like ninety percent efficient on every single rep he did, which is what able to bring his legs back up. Yeah. The most elite athletes in the world are lucky if they're averaging about 60 to 65 muscle fiber uh, recruitment during like the very last set of the very last rep of their workout. Yeah. So it makes training extremely efficient. You're using much less weight, much less reps, which is less wear and tear on joints and tendons. Mm -hmm. And I can do it 30 minutes on this. It'll take you two plus hours. To be honest, when it first came out, I was like, oh, here we go. I rolled my eyes pretty hard. I was like, oh, not another gimmick. But then... I think it was actually yeah. Dexter Jackson's legs because Dexter, I think twice we because you know he was in the, um, it was 2012 when he got fifth at the Arnold and his legs were starting to go and then he came back 2013 brought them back I thought and then when they started to slip the other year I thought he's not going to get them back he's nearly 50 now and he did it at the um, it was the Arnold Classic I was like what the and it was obviously we, we I saw the um, I saw the footage of of you doing that and I was like wow I'm now a believer you know because so how did um, how yeah. did this come about who who approached who with this machine and what what, what, was, so, what was the origin uh, origin of it a little over a little over two years ago my wife got in a severe accident at Gold's Gym Venice okay she was doing a hammer strength shoulder press but facing in on the machine and as she was up with a 45 and 25 on each side, mm -hmm. the seat collapsed and she went into a split in her knees and tore both the quad insertions, her hip, um, in, uh, quad insertions in her hip. Yeah. And 
she you went know, to the hospital. She she got to avoid surgery, but she was supposed to be in a walker for 12 weeks. And there was a power lifter that used to train with Mike O'Hearn that lives down in Austin, Texas, that deals with the company. And he followed us, and he thought we were really great people. So he reached out to NewFit and told him about my wife. So they sent us a machine just to to heal her as like a you know just a good deed. And, and obviously, we had a pretty decent social media following, so it gave them some publicity. And at 12 weeks, she was back to training legs at about wow. 70% strength. Three weeks, and she was supposed to be still in a walker. <laughs> so then we gave the device back. And that August, so about four months later, I ruptured my bicep down in uh, Destination Dallas doing a photo shoot for Gasp. Okay. And they were actually there doing a demo. And they're like, don't worry. We got you. We'll get you back on track. So I had surgery. They got a machine to me right away. And I was supposed to be 16 weeks without any direct bicep work. Yeah. I stepped on stage for Mania 14 weeks after wow. surgery. Wow. What, sorry, so, what, year, what year was that, mate? Was that 2018? That was 2018. No, no, uh, yeah, 2018. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Wow. So that's when I was like, I'm a believer. And I had never <laughs> tried it to train. It just, just for rehab. Okay. And I put myself through my my first arm workout on, on uh, Halloween in 2018. Yeah. And I was like fucking T-Rex for two weeks. <laughs> All I did was six sets on arms, and my arms hurt so bad I couldn't move. Oh, really? So I'm like, holy shit. So I bought the device. Yeah. I was lucky enough to have a, a couple people at Gold's Gym trust me to try the device on them. Yeah. And then it just started steamrolling, you know? And, and then I got on Dexter. Sean Roden had been using it. Sean yeah. loved it. Um, Dexter finally got into him, and uh, he let me train him on quads. We got in – about 17 sessions, I believe, going into the Olympia in 2019. <laughs> okay. And that was it. And that, that's the change we made. Um, and then from there, I've blown up. I've been working with Olympic athletes, with professional athletes left and right. Mm. Um, uh, I just became Mike Tyson's full-time trainer and rehab specialist. Yep. So uh, thank you for moving because I got to go down. Mike's got a bum back. Yeah, yeah Carl, film for the Carl, Discovery Channel. Sorry, sorry, Brad. Carl, might, that's why we got pushed back, mate, because um, this guy, Mike Tyson, I've never heard of him. I mean, he's uh, – so I was like, I, I don't know who this guy is, but okay, I'll let you move us back. So, uh, yeah, we got bumped back for Mike Tyson, so, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so, yeah, I mean, that was um, – you know, you know, talk about an absolute life changer right now for me is yeah. um, with Mike. So one of my – I've had this dream for about 18 months now, this project that I've been working on mm -hmm. and it's building one of the most elite performance and wellness centers in the world. And I had an original investor lined up, a client of mine who I met at a biohacking conference and I'd been training on the newbie mm -hmm. and I hate to say he ditched me, but he ditched me because he had to do, he, he got into this huge deal with Mike Tyson to open a spiritual wellness center in Antigua in Palm Springs. I've seen that so on his he, Instagram. I've seen it on his Instagram. Yeah. So he had to commit a huge chunk of money to Mike's thing. So he's like, sorry, Brad, Blah, blah blah. I, I you know I, I can't do this. I don't have the, the bandwidth to to handle this. Plus I got to put all this money with Mike. I'm like, oh, it's fine. So he was telling Mike about the machine, and all of a sudden one day he's like, Yo, Mike wants you to try the machine. Can you come to his office in El Segundo? I'm like, <laughs> Fantastic. I'll be there. Yeah, yeah. I walk in. Mike is high off of his mind, <laughs> fucked up on mushroom. He has no idea what's going on. I'm like, I'm totally wasting my time. He's not gonna fucking remember this whatsoever. Yeah. So I do a little scan on his shoulder. I work on his shoulder. He's just like, ah. I'm like, he's never going to remember this. Next thing I know, I get a call later that day. Hey, can you come back to Mike's tomorrow? I'm like, oh, my God. <laughs> sure, I'll be there. Yeah. So it started out, I was rehabbing Mike twice a week for about uh, three or four months, mm -hmm. uh, just working on his shoulder and his lower back. Mm -hmm. And then COVID happened, and you know, obviously everybody got locked down for a little mm -hmm. bit. And then Mike reached out again, and he's like, listen, he's like, my back's really killing me. Are, are you able to work during the lockdown? Are you afraid? I'm like, no, I'll fucking come work on you. Yeah. So I've been rehabbing him again, and then one day, you know, he was having a hard time because he boxes six days a week. Yeah. And he's like, he's like, you know, I just I keep tweaking stuff when I get in the ring. I'm like, Mike, let me warm you up on the machine before you get in the ring. Mm -hmm. Watch how better you perform. The first day I did it, he almost knocked his boxing coach out. Was that? He's the, like, he, holy hang on a shit. Sec. Sorry, Brad. Was that the video on Instagram where we saw him and it's like because he just it it kind of came out of the yeah. blue, didn't it? Like because obviously we know he's been yeah. you know he put weight on and stuff, and then all of a sudden out of the blue a couple of months ago he did that Instagram post and it was like Mike Tyson back to his prime and he's like he's throwing his yeah. hands and you're thinking, whoa, and he's in great shape again. So you're 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 partly responsible for that then. So yeah, so it so it started wow, out when he just rehabbing like and I'm like Mike, I'm like. You know, so he wants to get in crazy shape. I'm like, this is what I do, Mike. I, I, I'm yeah. a nutritionist. I get people in shape. I can make you muscle and fitness cover worthy 
We'll land all these covers and let me train you on this too, because you know, you'll, you'll decrease your risk of being injured while you train on this. Yeah. So one day he's like, you gotta, I told him I had a gym in my house. I'm like, cause I built out my garage gym when everything locked down, I put about 20 grand worth of equipment in my garage. So I keep working. He's like, I'll come over to your house tonight and, and, and try it out. <laughs> so I trained him on it once. Yeah. Two days later, he's like, all right, you're my full-time rehab guy, my nutritionist <laughs> and my <laughs> fantastic. So, so I'm with Mike from like 1230 to about four o'clock every day. I okay. warm him up before he goes in the ring, he boxes, eat something small. And then he drives over to my house and trains at my house mm -hmm. and then takes off. Um, and I, you know, I just started his diet last week. They're taking me to the Bahamas next week with them. Cause he's doing a thing for discovery channel for shark week. Oh, and he's like, I can't function without you. He's like, can you travel? <laughs> I'm like, I'm going anywhere. <laughs> so, wow. you know, I'm going to the Bahamas with, with them. It's like, it, it's been crazy. And, and all this, as all this happened, I had been engaging with another potential investor for my, for my wellness center, my gym. Yeah. And literally on the same day, the investors committed a ginormous chunk of money to me, to my my facility, yeah. and Lane and Mike on the same day. Wow! You know, what day like, was what day was that? <laughs> so that was on June uh, June eleventh, which was exactly twenty two months from the day that I ruptured my bicep. Wow! Okay. When I ruptured my bicep, okay. So twenty two was my number my entire life. <laughs> In football, I, it was my entire life. Twenty-two has been my number in every single sport, okay. but my lucky number. We, we, we'll we'll, that we'll call that. Set. We'll call that Brad Roday, International Brad Roday. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. From now on, that's what it's so, called. Uh, <laughs> so Joe Binley, the owner of uh, Project AD, my sponsor, who yep. I've been with for over five years. Yep. He was in Dallas when I ruptured my bicep, and he was so pissed at me because I was moving a tire. You know, one of those dumb things that you shouldn't be doing. <laughs> And he's like, you, you fucking ruined your career. I looked him in the eye, I go, this is going to be the best fucking thing that ever happened to me. Watch mm. 22 months to the day. I land my investment for my gym and I land Mike Tyson's full-time thing. Wow. I called him like, Lord, I told you this is going to happen. Yeah. Yeah. But... So it's, it, it's been, a, it's been a hell of a journey, you know? And, um, like yesterday I was over Odell Beckham Jr.'s house and he's going to let me work on him this week. Um, hooking up with a couple players from the Dodgers this week. So like, I'm just, I'm steamrolling and, uh, this is the end of the bodybuilding career for me. Yeah. You know, oh, really? uh, I got one last run. Yep. Yep. Yeah. So my plan was this year to compete in the fall. I wanted to do the Arnold Brazil. Yep. That was one of my bucket list shows. I wanted to do the Cal New York, the Boston show. Cause I'm, I'm from new England. So it'd be an opportunity for my family to see me mm. compete for the first time and everything got kind of throw it out the window hmm. because when I open this facility, I need to lose weight. I need to get down. I need to drop about 20 something pounds Why? because I'm selling health and wellness. Right. You know, I'm not selling bodybuilding and I'm the face of this, you know, like yeah, but you, but if you guys see, but the thing is, Brad, you don't look, you don't look like a kind of lumbering out, you know, kind of like a 300 pound guy. You look good. I think you look good as you are. I think, I don't, I don't think right, you need right. to lose weight off that. You guys on social media, you see that like I still do athletic training and stuff like that. Yeah. I do ladder drills. I do box jumps. You know, I try to be an athlete. You know, I was an athlete yeah. growing up, and that's something that I try to never lose. But still, I mean, I'm like 255 right now, and that's just that's really imposing. How tall are you? People. How tall are you? So I'm uh, five nine. Five. Wow. Wow. Okay. So, <laughs> that's quite yeah, a decent yeah. weight. Yeah. yeah, I'm all legs. <laughs> <laughs> so you know. Yeah. If I can get down to like 230, still look, I'll still look imposing to most normal people, but I'll have more of a clean cut athletic look to me, which is going to be okay. the face of the brand of the business I'm trying to develop. Okay. So this is kind of my last run for, for bodybuilding. I'm going to hit a couple shows. I'm going to shoot for the cow in 11 weeks mm -hmm. and then Boston after that. And then the Legion show and then potentially Romania. Okay. So what do you, cause you compete at around, is it 225, 230? Is that what you compete at? No, I'm like two thirty. No, two thirty-five, two forty. Two. Oh wow, okay. Two okay. forty-two. Yeah. yeah, I was two forty-two in Japan. Um, cool. I was like two forty-one uh, two years ago when I did uh, Romania. Yeah, that's not that's not because I mean the thing I've always liked about your physique. I feel like you've 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 you, at some point in your career you, you were at a bit of a fork in the road and you, i think you could have gone in a direction where you kind of maybe went for that 20 extra pounds but you would have lost what i see as your calling card of your physique you're kind of i've mentioned it many times on the forum and you've always thanked me and stuff but i've always seen like that, that the clean lines and the separation it's like you've got the kind of 
the kind of separation that there's some of the really like the, the lighter 212 guys, but you're like at 240. And I've always respected that you've never kind of taken your physique down that other path just for the sake of coming in bigger, bigger, bigger. Well, I mean, I was, I was smart, you know I mean? I'm a realist <clears throat> and I know that me packing on 20 pounds still isn't going to win shows. You know, like I just don't, I don't have the clavicular width to really match up with some of these guys. I'm um, a very bottom heavy. So to me, it was about competing was about just self challenge. Yeah. I, I love, I love being on stage. I love pushing myself, but like I do commercial acting, you know, mm -hmm. I'm, I'm the guy that's always in shape. So every magazine that wants to shoot, I'm always available. Yeah. So I knew from a marketing perspective, what was going to make me more money in the long term, mm -hmm. you know, putting on all this size and trying to be more competitive or staying in my lane, having a, a, a clean cut physique and being in shape year round. And mm -hmm. then that's paid off dividends on, on my end. So yeah. I made that decision a long time ago to, to kind of stay that route. Plus the thing, I mean, being in somewhere like California, which is the real hub of, you know, the, the you, for things like film and acting and all these, to be kind of seen, you know, because like, how many hours a day are you at gold? Like eight, 10 hours a day or something? Not, not anymore. Yeah, it was like 12 hours a day when I'm, yeah. when I'm really into it so you're either training or you're training people and you're in shape so you're got you're a good looking guy you know you're clean cut and you've got a, a good physique so you're always going to be it's, it's it's in your favor to always be kind of in shape all year round looking good it's kind of your advert for your for your personal training so it's um it's really served you to kind of have that approach hasn't it yeah I mean you know when I when I first Ed Connors was the one that kind of convinced me to move out from from the east coast to, oh, okay. to California oh wow and, and he told me, he was like, every day you walk in that gym, look like a million bucks. He's yeah. like, you never know who's going to walk. In. You walk in looking like a slob one day yeah. and some crazy, you know, movie producer is going to be there. He's like, look great every day you walk in that yeah. gym. And that's, and that's kind of always been I'm one of those look good, feel good, play good athletes. You know, even when I was in college playing ball, you know, everything was, was crisp and clean on me. You mm. know, it was just, you know, I wasn't a prima donna. You know, I don't I don't wear fancy clothes, but everything looks good. And it's you know, I have my style and I stick to it. My hair is always done. You know, my face is always shaved. I'm always presentable because you never know who you're going to come across in life. You know, you don't want to be caught with your guard down. So what what is Gold's Gym like nowadays? What How is it? Because how many years have you been there for? Uh, Nine years. Nine years. So what's it like? Has it changed in the last nine years? Tell us significantly, you know, like so when I first moved out here, I totally got bamboozled. I came out here to visit. Uh, Ed flew me out to do the Excalibur in 2010. Okay. And uh, so it was kind of busy out here because that was kind of a bigger show. And then he flew me back out in February when they had the Flex Pro. So yeah. I came out here and obviously every pro in the world was at Gold's Gym <laughs> yeah, that day. Yeah. And I was like, I got to be here. This is it. Yeah. So I fucking sold everything I had, <laughs> packed up. Like, brilliant flew out here lived in a hotel room for like four weeks till i could find an apartment and there was no pros no one was at gold's gym anymore it was like jerome ferguson <laughs> and no. that's it and i'm like where were all these guys that were here earlier yeah so the scene was kind of dead at that point and then that's right around then is when hitatata started training there again and dexter started coming back mm -hmm. and then sean moved out to train with me in 2012 we were training partners for three years mm -hmm. um so it slowly started picking up. The vibe got back into bodybuilding again. Yeah. And it, it was nice to be a part of that. You know, I came up through the amateur ranks and, and kind of helped rebuild that culture of, of bodybuilding at Gold's. Mm -hmm. And then they just they just went the total corporate route, you know, with equipment. Like you, you couldn't get good equipment anymore because everything had to be leased. Everything had to go off in corporate. You know, they put in all these like CrossFit type racks. And the environment just changed. I mean, you still you still have Charles and, and Sean was there and, you know, Psycho Fitness was there. Um, but it, it's definitely just a, a different vibe and a different culture now. Mm, it's quite different from the well, the 80s when they had Mike Christian and, uh, well, they had right. everyone, everyone. I mean, you know, Rich, Rich Kaspari was there in the mid-80s. I mean, I can imagine what it was like back in the day. I mean, I, I've watched all the Battle for the Golds and kind of you romanticize yeah. about, you know, the, 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 the kind of golden era of Golds Gym. But I suppose like everything, it changed, evolves, new gyms open, people like Sean, does, Sean doesn't train there very often now, does he? Sean Roden. No, he's up in Oxnard. He moved up there to be closer to his daughter. Yeah, so he's, yeah. he's trained out of a world's gym or something like that up in that area. Mm. You know, Dexter comes back in July. Um, 
but I'm done. My days at Gold's are done. You know, I, I built out my garage gym. Mm -hmm. My clients love it. It has the equipment I need. It makes my training so much more efficient. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I went to Gold's the other morning with one of my clients to train, and I was just I walked in. And I was like, I'm over this. You know, it's like that <laughs> yeah, was a, yeah. a chapter. Of my life. Yeah. And it was an amazing chapter, and it brought me so much. But it's just. It, it, I'm just over that that phase, and I might go in once in a while, like every couple of weeks, I'll pop in for a workout. But I'm not training people there anymore. Mm. Um, you know, between Mike and people at my garage, um, and I go to Malibu uh, three days a week to train a couple clients out there. Okay, I've got more than enough on my plate to deal with as it is yeah. in the process of opening this gym as well. So, you know, my days there are done. <laughs> how much do you sleep? Because I'm trying to work out your schedule. <laughs> Like how many hours? Because you said you work at was it like five in the morning till eight or nine? Then you come home or you go somewhere else. Like you must be on the yeah. move all the time. How? Uh, yeah, that's you know it's it's my biggest strength and my biggest downfall. Um, you yeah. know I'm a workaholic. Uh, you know I'm up around two thirty three a.m. every day. Uh, <laughs> I clean my house. It's like a two hour process for me to get out of my house because I clean my whole house that's, that's while my when, poor wife and dogs you, are trying to sleep. That's when you go to bed, isn't it? Two thirty. Go to bed, right? Right. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Every morning I just start out with my fasted cardio. So I come in and I do my cardio. Then I typically have either a five or six a.m. client. Uh -huh. Then I'll have another client here, and then I'll like drive an hour to Malibu. You know, I get to bed around eight thirty, nine o'clock at night. So I'm getting about you know five, sometimes six hours of sleep a night. Yeah. Um, which, you know, uh, my, my wife and I are going through some rough times right now, and then we're. Uh, she just dropped the bomb on me the other night. We're going to separate for a little while and try oh. to work on ourselves. Okay. And it's, um, you know, it's one of those situations where, you know, it's, it's we both lay blame. You know, my, my wife uh, uh, runs a dog rescue and she's committed her entire life to that every waking moment. Uh, I'm trying to build something great. You know, it's one of those like catch 22s. I, I want to, I'm trying to kill myself to create this nest egg so that when I have kids and I have a family, I don't have to kill myself, yeah. but I've neglected her so much in that process that I'm never going to have the kids and the family. Right. And it's just, you know, so we've, it, there's, there's no animosity. We just, we neglected our marriage for the past two years okay. and, uh, you know, we, we need to find some inner peace, some inner happiness. So it's, you know, like I said, it's, it's a catch 22. I've got a lot of amazing things going on in my business life mm. and my personal life is in shambles. Um, but you know, I'm just one of those people that just, Regardless, just put my fucking head down and, and keep grinding and keep working. And, uh, you know, it's a, like I said, it's a, it's a, a, a catch-22 situation for me. Do you think you'll be able to get that balance back in your life so you can have all elements of your life kind of stable? Yeah, so that, that's, um, you know, you guys follow Dorian. Dorian's big into DMT. Um, so yep. one of my clients is uh, she runs, she's one of the top, spiritual plant-based medicine leaders in the world that psilocybin? Um, she created a resort is that psilocybin uh, or ayahuasca? So ayahuasca ayahuasca oh yeah 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 yeah, yeah well i actually um dorian um i actually had dorian on the show and he um he invited me out to costa rica to do the the, the retreat with him he said he, he'd said he'd hold my was hand through it <laughs> was it was it rhythmia so Sorry. The the resort the resort that she the resort that she created is Rhythmia. They're the number one place in Costa Rica. No, Dorian's got his one in. Um, Dorian's got his. Uh, I forget the name of it now. Is I've got. I've got I'm gonna follow their Instagram. But um, yeah, yeah, it was a little bit expensive for me at the time. But um, yeah. Dor Dorian said, "Don't worry." No, he said, you can, "I'll hold your hand through it and all that." So and uh, right. yeah. So, so they're gonna do a. I'm gonna I'm gonna go down that path. Um, you know, <laughs> we, we tried the counseling stuff, and the problem is, is. Uh, when you're so hardwired yeah. in our brain, therapy and counseling can never break that hardwiring because you're always going to push it away. Yeah. With the plant-based medicine, it breaks up that hardwiring bond and it makes you dig deep into whatever – you can have a perfect life growing up, but there was some traumatic moments as a child or, mm. or, or throughout your life. Have you done it that yet? Caused... Ha Sorry, Brad. Have you done no, it yet? No, no, no. Oh, you haven't done it yet? Okay. Uh, okay. Two In two weeks, I'm going to go. Oh, Wow. Yeah, but do you know, um, they're gonna do it. Do you know, I won't mention the bodybuilder's name, but a very, very top, top, top uh, current bodybuilder. Well, I was speaking to him a few weeks ago, and he said, do you know what, Charles? He says, I'd really love to do that. He said, but I'm actually worried that it might take away, because they said it strips the ego, and he said it, it might take away the kind of insecurity, the thing that drives me every day. He says, I'm worried. He says, I, I think I'll do it when my career is finished, because he says, I'm worried that it might backfire on me and not be as as beneficial as i'd want it to be right i 100 i and then those were my struggles yeah but here's how i look at it 
I'm, I'm in the process of losing the most amazing thing that's ever happened in my life. What do I have to fucking lose? You know, my, my wife is an absolutely incredible person. Mm. And if I can't change to be a better person and be happier on day to day and live in the moment more then all my success that I've created outside of our relationship means nothing to me. So, you know, that's, that's how I look at it. You know, I, 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 I was talked into trying to go down the Prozac route because I'm just no, I'm no, no, fucking no, no. like no, 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 erotic. No, that, that would, that would, and that I, would take away your, like, no, no, no. yeah, but Brad, that would take away right. your edge. That would take edge. away your, your kind of part, right. a big part of you that you really need to, you need to kind of, um, you need to incorporate all your different elements of your personality, not kind of like mask them. Suppress them. Yeah. Suppre sorry. Right. Suppress. Exactly. Yeah. That's the word. That's the word. Yeah. That's, 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 that's why I, I decided not to go down that route. You know, a therapist suggested me to try it. And I'm like, no, I just, no. I won't go down that route. I'll try the plant-based medicine. Cause I've heard, you know, very successful people that are still very driven. They just learn to, to, to love themselves more and, and appreciate the moments. And, yeah. and that's my biggest, like, like I said, that same day that I landed the, the investment and in Mike, <laughs> yeah. my wife's like, let's go get sushi and, and, and have champagne and celebrate. And I'm like, I got to be up at three o'clock in the morning. I got a photo shoot in 10 days with Pear Bernal. Yeah. Uh, no, no, it's all right. You know, it's like, it's like I can't even enjoy my successes because I'm so worried about what's next and wanting, wanting to create more, Brad, you I've know? Been, so I, it's, yeah, Brad, I've been around a lot of successful people and I like to pick their brains. And, and to be honest, that is the one thing that kind of, it's a double edged sword. It's kind of what it's, it's like you said, it's, um, it's a help and a hindrance at the same time because it helps their kind of six to, to, to go after what they're going after. And sometimes it's like, it's like people like yourself, you're doing multiple different things and you want them all to be a huge success. But at the same time, there's other elements of your life that can suffer as a result. So I honestly, I think, I think you're someone that is just insanely motivated and driven and like you said you want everything to be a huge success and you you know you're very goal driven but I think um I think you've just you've taken on a lot I think you've taken on a lot and I think you maybe maybe taking a step back will help you kind of reassess and prioritize um your life because that's what sounds like happen it's, it sounds like you put too much into one thing and maybe and you've slightly turned away from something else that needed that attention during those two right. years you know no, definitely. Yeah. And, and we're both guilty of that. You know, I'm guilty for being, just being a grumpy ass on a day to day basis. <laughs> I and, don't think you're grumpy. Are you grumpy? And, and both of us are guilty of, of we're both very independent people, mm -hmm. which is, you know, we're both only children raised by single moms. So we knew how to take care of ourselves. And that's amazing. But you can take that for granted mm -hmm. as well, because you know that if I go do this, she's okay or, or he's okay if I don't come home till late tonight, you know, that because yeah. neither of us have the coddling or attention. And then all of a sudden you just become best friends and perfect roommates yeah. and you lose that, that connection, that loss. And that's kind of where we're at right now. And like I said, it's not lost, you know, we're, we're not throwing in the towel. We're just going to take some time to work on ourselves and, uh, you know, hopefully get together and be better people, individual and, and, be a stronger couple to move forward in life. This sounds like a bit of a weird question, but have you spoke to Mike Tyson about this situation? Yeah, yeah. Mike and his wife are because yeah. they've, they've been down those paths. Yes, yeah, so I'm you saying because I I watched the um the Joe Rogan Mike Tyson and I I was so happy to see that he's in such a different place now because he really spoke. It's almost like he spoke about the old him as like a separate person. He was saying like the old Mike would have done this, the old Mike would have done, and he's someone who's really gone through life and it's um, and he's really changed. Like he's got his new uh, podcast and. It's someone who really has yeah. kind of come through a bit of a, I mean, you're just, you're just halfway through a journey. That's all. It's just, like you said, it's not the right. end. It's right. uh, you're going through a process where you need to reassess and prioritize. Yeah. No, Mike's, you know, Mike has an amazing heart. He really is. He's a, he's a truly caring person. Yeah. Um, him and his wife are amazing. You know, they've even, in, I've only been working with them for, you know, six, six months or so. And they're just, they're just been so good to me. And, and, you know, they, they saw the other day that I was just kind of down and out Yeah. and, and you know, his wife starts talking to me and next, you know, we're both crying and we're talking about <laughs> how the medicine helped her marriage and okay. everything, you know, and, and okay. you know, so it's, they're, they're good people. And, and, and that's the world that they're stepping into. They're really promoting this, you know, he, he does a, a, a DMT, which is based out of a toad yes. that really helped him the most. But it's very, very fast um, acting, isn't it? Very fast acting only lasts for yeah, about 10 yeah. minutes. Yeah, yeah, and it's a, it's a very quick journey where ayahuasca is, you know, four to six, sometimes eight hours of, of you know, deep, dark Oof. journey, but yeah. you come out a much better person. Yeah, I just, so, I, to be honest, know, it's, because um, I watched the Dr. Jordan Peterson 
and he talks about it and he said it's very good for things like depression and uh, and, and and anxiety and and kind of confronting kind of old uh, old demons if, if, if it makes if that's uh, right. yeah and it's um it seems to be and it is it's classed as, a, as like a medicine and it's something i've actually looked into but uh, I'm, I'm i'm actually in a very good place right now so i'm kind of i've kind of uh, it's kind of come out of my mind a little bit but it does interest me i think it's a very very interesting and if you can if the thing is even just the the gesture of wanting to do something about a situation that you're not happy about i think is half the journey i think it's half the solution once the fact that you even want to do that right you know it's the thing like like we went to counseling marriage counseling and we walk in and we sit down and she's like okay what's going on and, and me and my wife just spewed out stuff and the woman's like why are you guys here you know <laughs> yeah, what yeah, your yeah, yeah 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 you to work on she's like you guys are the easiest couple i've ever had in my life you you both <laughs> recognize your faults yeah you both recognize what you need to work on now you just need to work on it you know and that, that's what it comes down to the the, the 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 biggest step in self-help is understanding your issues and understanding yep. what your problems are yeah. and i'm fully aware of that it's one of those things that's like i come home and i'm just like i got stuck in traffic and i'm pissed off and i get home and i'm just grumpy and then I get madder at myself because I'm even in a fucking grumpy mood. And then it's just you just down a rabbit hole yeah. and like and you're fully aware that you're fucking pissed off over nothing. Yeah. But you can't pull yourself out of it. It's like, what the fuck? You just so, you're you know, just I'm, both I'm very pa- you're, you're both just very passionate, dedicated people. I think that's quite evident. But um, well, I hope you two, you guys, you both you guys work it out because it's um, you sound like really good people, yeah. you know. So um, so yeah, let's go back to um, let's go back to bodybuilding. Let tell me tell me about when you turn yeah. pro because I want to know a little bit more about how you turn pro. So I turned pro in 2013 at nationals uh-huh. uh, as, as a heavyweight. Um, I had done pretty much every qual- pro qualifier in. 2011, 2012, <laughs> and finally turned pro 2013. Yeah, I would say they just they just got so sick of fucking seeing me that they finally like just just give him <laughs> give him a card and update. Give him a card here. and get rid of him. Uh, yeah, yeah. So you know the same show that was the show that Kevin Jordan turned pro at. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, and then then I got really lucky, and the next year I decided to jump right in and compete. I started out um, with. Uh, I took that that spring off and I competed at the uh, what did I do? I did Phoenix as a as a my pro debut, mm-hmm. and I ended up getting third at Phoenix. And there was That's enough good. people that thought I should have beaten Johnny Jackson and uh, wow. um, well, I can't remember the other gentleman's name, but it was enough. You know, being being a rookie, I, I definitely held my own, and and you know could have been up there if I got first. No one would have complained. I went out to Russia. Uh, a week later and get my ass kicked, but it was more or less <laughs> who by I got lost who by yeah, yeah, oh, everyone <laughs> I got lost so, Okay, you know Ronnie Raquel and William Bonac were one and two and then they went with these huge monsters mm. For the next five or six guys then they threw me kind of a smaller physique in there So I get it, you know the trend that they they went with the judging um, And then I went out to the Frigno and I took second at the Frigno to uh, Ronnie Raquel Oh, 2015 2015 uh, 2014. 14. 20, are you sure? Yeah. Are you sure? No, 2014. No, because I know. Remember, yeah. Patrick Tua. Patrick Tua prepped uh, Ronnie because I'm diabetic, and um, I, I spoke to Ronnie Raquel yeah. about how he manages to prep and train and compete with being diabetic, and uh, that was right. the year Patrick Tua prepped him, and it was because we all kind of thought he was done, you know, and then he. Uh, Patrick brought him in almost like his best ever. So you really beat like a yeah. real prime top six Olympia guy there, you know. You you really uh, you got beat yeah. by somebody in their best ever shape, you know. Right. Um, you know, it, you had guys like Maurice Doan was yeah, in there yeah, and yeah. beat him. And, you know, so there's some pretty easy names. And then I turned around and that spring I did the cow and I ended up getting third at the cow. Um, you know, it was a it was a final two call out between me and Dallas McCarver. Mm-hmm. And then, you know, somehow I went from a final two call out to getting third. Mm-hmm. I don't know how that works in judging. Uh, <laughs> yeah, it's confusing. And, and uh, you know, then I got a couple more fifth places. I went in Chicago, got a fifth. I went into... Uh, what else? Show I can't remember what I said that year, but anyway, I ended up earning enough points to qualify for the Olympia, hmm. and so as a rookie, my rookie year, I ended up making it to the Olympia I remember. in 2015. Wow, what was that, that like? Was, what was that, that was like? Is well, I mean, to go from turning pro and you know, to, you know, a couple of years later to being on well, the first year being on stage at the Olympia, what was that like? Yeah. Oh my God, it was just it was such an amazing ride. You know, it was <laughs> it was me and Sean Roden trading together, and you know him behind me, and you know like you got to figure it's so much motivation to be Mm. training with Sean at the time, but we were both working with Chris Aceto. So every morning we met each other at the gym to go upstairs in the posing room, take pictures for each other to send to Chris. So here I am 
taking pictures with the number two bodybuilder in the world. Mm -hmm. And I'm like, I look terrible. I'm like, I'm gonna get my ass kicked. <laughs> oh, it keeps you, keeps you working hard, doesn't it? Yeah, I was backed out of my pro debut and Sean's like, no, I promise you, you're gonna do okay. Mm. And I still didn't believe him. Then Sean put his money where his mouth was. He was like, hey, I want you to go to Russia. I'm like, I can't afford to fly out there. He's like, I'm gonna buy you and Steph's flight. Did he? Did he do that? Yeah. So he, he paid for for me and my wife to fly to Russia. That's cool. And I was like, oh, that means he has confidence in me. Yeah. So you know, nice. I so I followed through, and um, you know, the Olympia experience was crazy. Obviously, like it's just one of the most nerve wracking things that <laughs> yeah. you know, especially you know, your first time up there. And I had the pleasure of following up Rolly Winkler. Oh so God. So Rolly goes <laughs> reposing. <laughs> Fun favorite. Tired. <laughs> going nuts you know he's he was the fan favorite back then too then it's like yeah hey brad out. yeah <laughs> I, before i heard booze I oh heard booze, no we like, bring back roly bring back oh, roly <laughs> yeah like, oh god but uh it's, it's you know, like when someone it's good. like when someone does a really amazing posing routine and you think oh my posing's just average and then it's like the crowd's going and they're like oh you know it's like wow, right, right. Wow. just I, totally suck the air out of you <laughs> fantastic but, uh, you know, and I, and I ended up doing pretty well. You know, I, I mean, I, you know, they, I got 16th, but again, you know, I, if I had been around the circuit longer, I think they could have put me in like 13th, 14th spot. Yeah. You know, I, I could have held my own. The, the main thing, the main um, thing is though, Brad, days. the main thing is you've always, I've never once seen you ever, ever, ever turn up out of condition. Your condition is, it reminds me of like Flex Lewis's where it's just so consistent and it's so separated. It's like, yeah, I, I think that is a real, I think sometimes that's more of a, rather than the guys that just kind of um, are very rarely in shape, then they turn up in shape and then they win a show. I think there's there's more in it for the guys that are more consistent, that just keep consistently, consistently coming in condition. I think there's a real there's real merit in that. I appreciate that. And that, that's kind of what I've always, I'm, I'm never one of those guys that chase size around this. You know, to me, it's, yeah. I'd rather, I'd rather lose because I'm, because I'm too small than, than lose because I'm too fat. You ain't, you ain't small, you know? but you, I like the, I love here. I've said many times, I love that crisp, you know, the hard, the deep separation. I'm, I'm real, I'm a real stickler for that, you know, because I, I think if I was, I had your physique, I'd be the, I'd probably follow, I'd want to follow the same approach as you and just kind of retain that kind of quality, you know, because I think it's, it's, it makes you stand out from some of the other guys, you know, for, for good reason. Yeah. Yeah. Now that's, uh, you know, I'm, I'm very modest in how I look at myself and my physique. Mm -hmm. And, but the one thing I can say when I do look at photos, if you do, regardless of size and shape, you just look at the polish. Yeah. Like I'm always polished looking guys up there. Tan's always posing, good. The tan, the posing. Yeah. Physique. It's, it's, it's a very, I, I love the look that I bring to a lot of shows, even though it's not a winning look. You know, it's it, it might not be that competitive, but I truly believe that that's what bodybuilding is, that nice polished look. Yeah, yeah. Plus, um, I mean, I want to go on to the, like, the TV and the acting work um, because obviously that's why you stay in shape because, it's, you know, that's how it gets. Tell us about that. Yeah, I mean, that's, that's kind of how I got into bodybuilding. I was, um, oh, right, okay. I was on my trying to apply to medical school, finished, had finished grad school and was broke as shit and a uh, agent reached out to me they saw my uh, myspace profile picture MySpace. i was the ultimate wow yeah i was the I'm ultimate throw back <laughs> like hey do you, google do you want to do fitness model I'm like i'm like listen i'm like i'm not gonna pay to have a photo shoot done or any shit like that i'm like if you can book me something and i get paid for it yeah i'm open yeah and within two weeks i ended up booking a, a muscle and fitness and a gnc ad campaign wow within two weeks of submitting photos um, end up being a three year run for a GNC ad campaign, which mm. is a huge payout. I flew to New York to do a photo shoot and there happened to be a, a commercial audition. When I went, I went in, nailed the audition, booked my first commercial, wow. uh, moved to New York to live with my agent mm -hmm. and pursue that booked a couple more commercials. And then he was like, you need to compete. We can get more exposure. We can get you, you know, um, uh, contracts. So I started getting ready for a show and I, and I, he reached out to university nutrition cause I could hit a good vacuum and they were doing this seventies, yeah, yeah. you know, <laughs> their stuff. So, yeah. uh, I ended up doing a test photo shoot with universal signed my first contract uh, a week before I ever stepped on stage. And then that summer's when Ed Connors had reached out to me, okay. flew me out to California and said, and he's like, listen, this is, you need to be in California. This is the epicenter of commercials and, and magazines at the time. AMI was still out here yeah. in California. So 
you know, he flew me out there and, and I told my family, Hey, I'm going to take a three year leave and, and <laughs> see what happens. And I moved to California and, you know, I got really lucky and I've booked probably about 30 something national commercials. Yeah. Um, you know, I've, I've done things with Sylvester Stallone. I've done things with Arnold. I've done things with Dolph Lundgren and, uh, Danica Patrick and, um, <laughs> Jesse from, uh, from, uh, full house, you know, so, mm-hmm. I've, I've had an interesting journey. You know, it's, it's been a unique ride. Have you, have you trained as an actor? Have you been to acting classes yes. or? Okay. No, 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 never, never. Nope. Oh, really? I took, I took one initial commercial acting class when I was in New York. Yeah. And I was so busy with work running around that I went to like three of the, the 20 classes and, and bailed. <laughs> so Brilliant. Wow. There, was a, there was a time about a year and a half ago before the newbie came into my life that I was yeah. gonna start pursuing acting and I was at a point I was just I was over bodybuilding I was over training people and uh, I was gonna take classes and then I just started really thinking about it and I was like mm. that's the last thing I want to do truly like I have no passion for it mm. like I'm the last like being on set is such a long boring day you know even if you're lucky enough to book good work mm-hmm. you're on set for you know six to twelve weeks 12 14 hour days you have no life whatsoever then if you do become famous you have no life because <laughs> yeah, yeah you know like, like as cool as the rock is that that guy can't go anywhere you know yeah. i'm not saying i'll ever get to that level but just it, it just wasn't appealing to me anymore so i i kind of turned my back to that i'll do the commercial acting stuff because that's easy literally you just you get an audition call maybe the morning of or the night before you show up take your shirt off scream into the camera or something <laughs> dumb like that yeah yeah one line then you uh, you know, and then you get like a ten to, to twenty thousand dollar payout for one day's worth of work. Wow! So it's you know that's that's convenient. It's easy. It helps me maintain my SAG eligibility. I get good health yeah. insurance with the SAG union. Oh, okay. So you know, yeah. So that's that's kind of what I've just stuck with. So what was your favorite job, acting job, from all those thirty five jobs or whatever? Um, definitely the one with uh, Sylvester Stallone and Dolph Lundgren. Oh, tell us. So we did a. It was a Takate commercial for um, the World Cup a few years back. Yeah. And they just told us it was with A-list celebrities and we weren't even allowed to look at them or talk to them or anything like that. And <laughs> Don't get on set and, you know, I'm there in a tank top. And as soon as Sylvester Sloan yeah, walks in, he's loved like, it. I bet he loved it. Holy shit. Walks over, grabs my arms. And we literally held up production for like an hour. Did you? And we're just shooting the shit. <laughs> training. Fantastic. You know, and all the producers and everybody's sitting there like, Really? <laughs> I'm yeah. like, hey, he's the one that came up to me. So yeah. that was that was a really cool moment. That was probably one of the, the, the coolest he commercials that ever I, done. I remember when I've seen, um, I when I heard about the Expendables and I uh, heard he's, because he organized all that with all the actors. He picked them all and he seems like a really, really good guy. He seems like someone who's really um, never sort of forgot his roots and, you know, and uh, very, very, uh, like how he's helped Mickey Rourke, you know, when he, when Mickey Rourke was in a bit of dire straits years ago and he kind of reached out to him and he seems like a really, really, really good guy. Yeah, yeah. No, from, from the, the the brief interaction I had with him was great. I know his brother Frank, um, his younger brother. He trains at Gold's Gym all the time. Okay. So, you know, that's that's a beauty of Gold's. You, you meet so many people, and there's so many connections to to, to be had in there. Mm. So, uh, what do you think is going to happen at the Olympia this year? Then <sighs> it just depends on what the travel issue is. Yeah. You know? yeah. If, unfortunately, right now, now things in the U.S. A lot of states, the the virus is starting to pick up again. So you're seeing states like Texas and Florida that didn't really have strict shutdowns that are starting to lock down again. Mm-hmm. And those are states that we're going to hold professional sports in. Mm-hmm. So I just I don't see international travel happening. So we're going to lose a lot of guys. You're not going to be able to get the Hadi Chopins. You know, you're not going to be able to get the Nathan Dashes and the Rolly Winklers over here because Trump just shut down work visas as well. Oh, so you can't even come here on a work visa, so they can't even apply for that. So oh, no. the guys like Ian Valerine, you know, the Canadian guys, they're not going to be able to travel. So it's it's going to be. Do you think it's? Well, I mean, we're still rough, five. Rough. We're five months away, five six months away. Do you think it will by then? It will ease or? I, I hope so. I mean, yeah. I, I look at it. We're we're doing way too much. You know. There's people are are naive to think that we're actually going to stop the spread. That's that's not going to happen. Mm. What we're what we need to look at is deaths and hospitalizations. Mm. And deaths and hospitalizations have plateaued off and actually decreased. Positive numbers have increased because we're 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 being more active now. But we want that. We need to create herd immunity. So we need oh, more immunity. positive asymptomatic so cases. So you're into the herd immunity uh, theory. 
Yeah, yeah. It, it, it has to happen. We, we, we're not going to have a vaccine for two years no. or else you're not fucking injecting me with a vaccine that you created in six months. I'm sorry. <laughs> yeah. I, I, I like a lot of the other things that go on in my body. <laughs> yeah, but, yeah. Um, you know, and, and obviously the in the U.S., the, the virus is huge, but we're also in an election year mm -hmm. and politics, unfortunately, plays a, a huge factor into what's going on in our state and in, in our country. Um, so you're seeing a, a lot of bullshit between the, the right and the left. Mm. And, you know, I'm, I'm an independent and I think they're both fucking idiots. Um, <laughs> it's, a, it's, a, it's a crazy, it's a crazy yeah. battle that, that's going on. And, and unfortunately, the American people are suffering, yeah. you know. So obviously, a lot in the last few weeks, there's been, um, you know, with the um, with the, uh, the, the Black Lives Matter movement, and all that and the riots and stuff. like. That. Are you in a safe area where you live or have you, have you been affected by this or? I'm in a predominantly black neighborhood. Okay. You know, un unfortunately. Yeah. Um, which is in a, in a way it's safe because they're not devastating their own places. They're they They tore up Beverly Hills. They tore up Santa Monica. Um, they, they ride in downtown a little more affluent white places. Yeah. Um, so I'm, I'm in a, I'm in a, a pro, I'm in Inglewood, which is a predominantly black neighborhood. Um, it's the only place I can afford to buy a house in LA, and that's still three quarters of a million dollars for a shitbox in, in the hood. <laughs> is it, I uh, heard it's very expensive, isn't it, in LA? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So, yeah, yeah. but um, you know, it's it's. I don't know. Again, I, I I think there needs to be systemic change, mm. but this isn't the way of going about getting it done. Okay. You know, the the, the violence and everything else. You're just an eye for an eye makes the whole world blind. Is, yeah, is how I. You know, yeah. so it's it's a bit a bit of a scary time, isn't it? I can't, I kind of with the whole COVID thing and all this, I kind of live out in the kind of middle of nowhere. So I've I've just been just doing my own thing and kind of just just I've been trying to stay off Facebook, especially because that's just an absolute sewer. And um, right. just yeah, it's just a, it's just oh god, that is just the somewhere you don't want to go now. And um, just trying to just just individual responsibility and just kind of stay out stay out of out of the way really you know i mean i went into the local city uh yesterday i haven't been for three months and there was just a very strange atmosphere and everyone wearing masks and kind of everyone looking at each other and being wary of each other and it was very it was very oh, everything's one way it was a very it was quite a quite an intense and i was thinking i wouldn't like to live in a city right now i would not want to live there I, i'm quite happy just in fact i would rather move further into the countryside you know where there's literally no people <laughs> Right, you know, I agree on that. So, so, so yeah, okay then. Um, do you want to? Obviously, I'm AD. Uh, give old Joe Binley. Uh, it's a, a British supplement company. Give them a little. Uh, give them a plug. Yeah, no, I just you know I've been with AD for over five years, and and Joe's been absolutely amazing to me. Anybody that's tried his products knows his products are great. But on top of that, Joe's just an amazing person, and you know he treats his athletes more than athletes. We're family. Joe's, you know, I'm one of close Joe's closest friends, and. You know, he's always been there for me and my wife, and, and I can't thank him enough for everything that he's done to support me throughout the years. So I just definitely want to give a big shout out to him. Is Ravenous his best product? You know what? I like the nutraceutical line, to be okay, honest with you. Okay, okay. The new one. Yeah. yeah. And, you know, I'm, I'm huge into the, the wellness spectrum. So, yeah, yeah. you know, the, the curcumin and the liver products and, and all those those actual health and wellness stuff are, are absolutely amazing. Yeah. No, it's, it's a, it is a good company. He's done so well. I mean, I always, I always usually bump into him and um, the guy's, an, he's like yourself. He's an absolute workaholic. He never stops. Yeah, yeah. So we're, we're definitely wired the same. So yeah. we get each other a lot. Okay, know. then, Brad. Well, I also um, I want you to let me know what happens with the ayahuasca because I'm curious to know. Because um, like I said, I was very interested because I was out a bit of shit year last year, part of my French. Um, remember, and yeah. Um, yeah, I had a few yeah a few problems myself, and I was like, oh, maybe ayahuasca is the is 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 a one way to kind of help the sort my life out. But I just kind of um, things just kind of day by day got better and better, and I kind of got my act together, but um, and brought my life together. But yeah, so let, I'm curious to know how it helps you. Um, I hope that there's no there's no negative effects for you, and you don't have to. I hope it's not too kind of traumatic for you to kind of face up to any things that uh deep in your psyche but uh, i hope it goes well yep. i hope everything um, works out for you with your, your your domestic situation and uh and very very excited to um see you on stage this year as well mate thank you very much for having me on i truly appreciate it and i will uh let you know how life unravels in the next few months okay then brad well finally got you on brad so yeah yeah <laughs> it's another one ticked off <laughs> okay <laughs> All right, then, Brad, thank, thank you so you. much and uh, look forward to speaking to you again soon. All right. Take care, Josh. Thank you, Brad. Bye -bye.
and welcome back to MD Global Muscle here at the On The Rise Media Studio with me, your host, Giles Thomas, and we are joined by British pro, Samson Dowda. Yay! <laughs> What's up, guys? How you doing? How you doing, Samson? I spoke to you, I think it said on the Skype there, I not spoke to you for about a year, so... Yeah, I know. It's been a while, though. What's going on, mate? Yeah, yeah. It's been a year already. Yeah, so for the... I mean, obviously, viewers, most viewers will know exactly who you are. You've been on Global Muscle a couple of times before. Um... Last, I think the most significant show you did last year was the British Grand Prix when you took second to Nathan Diasha. Do you want to take us yeah. through what's happened since? Well, obviously, since then we did a few shows in the US, and then and um, then the show in Spain, you know, came came uh, a few top five places and stuff there. Mm -hmm. But obviously, we didn't get enough points for the for the Olympia. Mm -hmm. But since then, we just kind of come up with obviously feedback and what we need to work on coming into this year, and. Well, from what we got back, it's obviously just tied up the condition a little bit more. Sorry, one second, one second. What's that noise? Is there like a wind? Is there wind going through your house or something? How's that? Yeah, it's just like a real... Um, it's like a rumbling noise. What's, what is there? Is, something pl is there something... It's fine now. Is, is it fine now? Yeah, it's fine now. Yeah, I'll, I'll just keep talking and we'll edit this. All right. Okay. So yeah, so basically we're just kind of working on the feedback that we got the judges, you know, working on the back, the back thickness and sort of kind of bringing more bigger and redefined back in that way. So we basically kind of taking time off and just kind of, you know, put our head down and went back to that old school training method that we kind of, we used previous year to kind of put on that much more side. So mm. yeah, it just, it's just be grafting since then, you know, just mm. completely pushing as hard as we can and kind of change our training style to match that yeah. and kind of prioritizing the weaker points again. And yeah, it's kind of going from there. Yeah, so the reason, I mean, the reason you kind of popped up into my head as someone I wanted to get on the show uh, again, like now, was because you're current of the photo. We saw some video of you. Um, you're in very, very good condition. Uh, uh, how many weeks out are you from the Tampa? Is it six weeks out from Tampa? At the five, five, five weeks this, this weekend. So okay, so what's the, situ right. what's the situation then with, um, are, you, are you just prepping with, with no clear answer so of what's going to happen? Yeah, because basically we started off the year thinking that our first show was going to be the Arnold Classic in South America before the whole crazy lockdown and everything else started happening. So we were already prepping for that show. And I think we were about what, five weeks out from then when oh, the lockdown thing yeah. came on. And it was a real kind of like doozy for everybody. Hmm. So it was kind of a case of, okay, what do we do then? Do we kind of just cut, shut everything down and, you know, go back to just off season or anything like that? But in my point of view, I just thought, okay, you know what? No. I'll carry on prepping anyway. Mm -hmm. Carry on training just as hard as I can and push through that whole situation, just carry on going. Mm -hmm. So we just did that. We carried on going. We carried on prepping and pushing the actual condition as far as we go. And where it came to the point where we were having shows then pop up, like during that early June, we we're looking at early June time. Yeah. And you had like um, the Boston Pro, you had Chicago and California that was meant to be happening at those, time, happening at those times. Mm -hmm. So we thought, okay, we'll aim, we'll aim for them. Well, as soon as we get, anytime we get closer, obviously the shows gets cancelled, everything gets pushed back. Mm. So we just basically stretched on, carry on prepping anyway. Yeah. And it got to the point where they finally cancelled the show, moved all the show, and it was it was kind of clear that the first show of the year might just end up being Tampa, which is obviously late July, early August. Yeah. So we shut it down for three weeks, you know, kind of have a break for three weeks and everything else, and then came back, you know, about, I think it's about four weeks ago, and started prepping again. I tried dialing in for this actually um, for Tampa Pro, mm -hmm. so it's kind of just been a basically a full year of prepping since January. Oh you know? no! Yeah, with no so show. You can sort and of you, imagine, and you, yeah, and you still with no don't show know. In pace, yeah. Without no, yeah, you know, with no end in sight, no nothing like that. But you know, I just thought you know it was a, it was a challenge, and without a doubt, it's been absolutely hard and you know grueling for everybody. And you know, it's just kind of from where I just see, I just thought you know I got to put my head down and focus on something. If I just sat there and not try or just say oh I'm just gonna shut everything off i know how much it will affect me mentally yeah so i just thought you know what if i focus on this regardless there is no showing day but if i could just kind of keep me something to keep me distracted and start feeding to all the negativity and everything that's happening around the world it'll give me a good distraction hmm. so yeah we just kind of just read with it and just we didn't have a showing date we didn't have anything my thought was basically any show that pops up as the first yeah. one I'll, I'll get on stage and do that yeah so, yeah How's your training been? Have you managed to train okay? And have you have you have you managed to? Is it been a case of yeah, just kind of getting by, or have you actually managed to make any improvements? 
I've, I've been lucky. I've been lucky because um, I got I had a mate out as he on a gym, and he basically gave me the keys to it and said, you know what, I know your brother, I know you're getting ready for show, so here you go. And although it was almost, I mean, it was 45 uh, miles drive from where I live, oh, so I basically finished from yeah. So every day I finish from work, drive oh, an hour and a half, wow. hour to get there, drive an hour hour to get back home. Wow. You know, just to make sure to get just to make sure that I got training in. Mm. And he had it was a proper old school gym, and it's like proper, you know, the old gym with the rust, the weights, the you yeah, know, the pump, yeah. pump. so it kind of brought back things back to that you know roots of everything, mm. and you know, like the old Roddy Coleman style, so thinking of something. So I come, I absolutely loved it, you know, I just went in there and just completely the whole situation of everything that's happening, so sort of motivated me to really go as hard as I can. So we started making a lot of improvements. Because we changed our training style because it was a different gym, mm. and we didn't have that sort of equipment that we were used to. Yeah. So we kind of went back to old school, just free weights and as heavy as you can lift. Mm. You know, high reps, high sets. You know, kind of just pushing that part in NASA, and it kind of worked a lot. You know, we were surprised when we actually came out the other end, thinking, "Wow, you know, yeah. you're pretty much in shape." Because we were prepping at the time, and we're looking, going, "Man, you're pretty much in shape of nearly 280 and 280 pounds." <laughs> wow. We, we were looking at, we were looking at it, and I've, you know, I posted some picture up a few weeks ago. I think actually about four or five weeks ago first, at the time before I cut the prep off and mm. took three weeks break, I posted a picture of Ben because then we, that was us in shape. Yeah. And we looked at it and it was about 280 pounds at the time. We were thinking, holy crap. 200, and sorry, we, how, t- how tall are you, Samson? I'm six foot. Six foot 280. Wow, that's a that's a yeah. good size, man. And, you know, and it was kind of a scary thought for us because we looked at it and go, are we seeing, it was almost one thing where you see it and you think, are we truly seeing what we're seeing? And we were yeah. like, yeah, we see shit. So we thought, okay, you know what, no problem. Just cut it down, shut it off for three weeks. Give yourself a mental rest, you know, don't, you know, just take a break and everything. So we basically shut it down for three weeks. And then when things started looking like they started lifting lockdown, things started getting a little bit better, we basically went back into prepping again mm. and started dialing it back down. So that's where we sort of are now, you know, five weeks out. You've, so yeah, it's yeah. been interesting. You've, and I saw that and obviously the video we're going to be using in this uh, in this episode You've managed to keep the waist small still, mate. I'm very impressed oh, yeah. how you've managed to do that. That's that's that's, <laughs> that's quite a feat because you've managed to because you've come up in you've come up very fast as a bodybuilder and you've put you've gone from a, a certain point in your physique and you've put a lot of size on consistently over a, a relatively short period of time. But and a lot uh, what what a lot ha- happens with a lot of people, a lot of athletes is their waistline blows out and you've still managed yeah. to do that. Have you done that consciously or is it just you've just been lucky? We've done that. Yeah, we have done that consciously, and it's one of those things that. We obviously paid a lot of attention to because of the theme I work with my girlfriend coaching me and then Chris Jones, the oldest body I've ever I know kind of working with me. Yeah. We know that my biggest and powerful strong point is that shape mm. and lines and symmetry. No matter how much size you can put on, if you lose that, you basically you mm. you ruin you ruin your strongest point. So regardless of how much weight size I put on, yeah, we always pay very close attention to your waistline. You know, how much are you blowing it out, how much are you can you hold it in? Even in the off season, can you still hold your stomach in? Can you still pull the vacuum? Can you do it? So if you watch most of my, um, follow me through my uh, profile on Instagram, even in the off season when I'm hitting the front double, I'm hitting it with a with a with a vacuum. You I'll, know, uh, guys, it, I'll, 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 plus pound. I will attest to that. I've seen it, and it, it that's that's true because I remember last yeah. year when you were posting pictures and you were saying you're a certain body weight, and people were like, "Are you sure he's?" It's like, and yeah. you are. Uh, you're, yeah. you're, yeah, you, and that's. To, to be that kind of body weight and to have aesthetics and a small waist and to be able to pull a vacuum, I mean, that is... Re- and you don't have a weak body part. I think that is why people, oh. I think, are talking about you as much as... The- because you're improving, you're managing to keep the waist small and you're, you're consistently moving forward. Even during everything that's gone on this year, you've still managed to find a way to improve. So that is... That's really in your credit, Samson. Oh, thank you very much. I think because our training hasn't changed from when we first started, I haven't actually, you know, fall into any rhythm of anybody else, anybody's training style. We've always kept things very mm. basic and very simple right from the get go. And yeah. most of the time, I, as guys ask me, oh, what do you do? What do you do? And I tell them that like, this is my training schedule. This is my training style. This is my diet. And they look at me, they almost shocked because there's nothing unique about it. Mm. And they're thinking like, oh, you know, don't you do this? Don't you do that? I said, look, the reason why it's, it looks that way is because it's worked right from the get-go. Yeah. We've never had to really truly adapt it much. We just alter little things here and there to make it carry on pushing the progress. But mm. we never had to. And it's just always worked. And because we sort of found that formula in the beginning part of it, we knew how to kind of manipulate it to make it work for me. Mm. So when it comes to like putting on size, we have to figure that part out of, okay, how much food can I actually 
not just eat, but how much food can I process in my system? Mm. And what kind of meals they are. Before I used to try to obviously eat a lot of junk food to try to make up the calories. Mm -hmm. But we kind of switched that idea of from trying to eat just a lot of junk food, but trying to eat a lot of clean food, but in a bigger quantity of it. Mm -hmm. So we've manipulated all these little things and training style. We have to change my training style from kind of doing more isolative and you know contracted stuff to, okay, lift a lot more heavier raw weights with good form and everything and I was trying to go for more that method and we just found that those things tend to work more for me mm. and we just it just kind of all clicked and now we're sort of getting into a rhythm for it and it just seems to be working yeah well you said it you said it earlier and um you know it worked for Ronnie Coleman that training that style training an old school hardcore yeah. gym and you know it's like the basics yeah. the base Dorian the D Ronnie you know the two of the greatest Mr Olympians yeah. ever that basic style of training worked for them right up until they retired yeah, and that's exactly it. That's, I mean, I watch them guys constantly. I watch what they do. Mm. And I feel like if you're ever going to want to be the best, you have to learn from the people that have done it already. Mm. And for me, I've always seen them guys achieve great, I mean, amazing things. Mm. I mean, you look at Ronnie, look how much he was squatting, look how much he was bench pressing, look how much he was, you know, rack pulling and everything else. Mm. And you think, well, there's a reason why he has a back he has. So when they told me, you know, you need to improve your back. I'm thinking, okay, what do I do? First thing I think is, oh, I'm just going to train like Ronnie. You know, <laughs> yeah, as but... much as heavy. <laughs> why, not? why not? Why not? Why not? Yeah. You know, why not? Like the heaviest weight I can possibly lift for as many reps as I can pull out of it yeah. until I can't stand at the end of the day and I'm on the floor. Mm. So basically that was the training style. So coming back into a crazy old school gym, it just so clicked at the right time to do it. Yeah. So as soon as I go with my training partner, I go with the guy that owns the gym, Chris, and we basically come up with our mindset. Okay, you know what? Pick that heavy thing up and just lift it until you can't lift anymore. <laughs> and it just, everything seems to just click and it completely killed me. Did you know, it? but it worked. It worked. It really did work. And I'm like, okay, now I'm kind of, you know, glad about it. Are you a strong bodybuilder, Samson? I don't think I think I'm decent enough. I mean, I don't think I've trained with anybody that could sort of outlift me throw so me, far. Come on, come so. on, th throw me some numbers. Throw me some numbers. Show what, off. Come uh, on, show what, off. Show off a bit. Uh, what, uh, <laughs> <laughs> squat doing six six plates aside on squats. Yeah. Uh, rack pulling four or five plates. Wow. Uh, bench pressing four or five plates. Jeez. So it's, it's, you know, and for me, I don't count a rep if it doesn't, if you can't do more than five, yeah. five reps on something, it doesn't count. Yeah. For me, I'm like, yeah, that's just, you're going for your BP or personal best man. You got to at least do four or five sets minimum. Good. So, yeah, um, I mean, four or five reps minimum. Bit of a segue this, but um, for me, the best look you had last year was at the British Grand Prix when you took second yeah. to Nathan Diasha. That was a good battle. Um, I thought Nathan brought his best look last year at that yeah. show as well. What were you... As, as a gauge, what were you weighing last year at the British Grand Prix? Well, so last year when I did the British Grand Prix, I was 270. 270? <laughs> yeah. Holy shit. <laughs> so, and this year we're 10 pounds heavier already, so... <laughs> so you think, so you think by the time you step on stage next time, in that same condition, you'll yeah. be 280? I think at least 280 how, at this point. How, how big's your waist? How, how many, how many oh, inches? My waist is, I've got 32 inch waist. <laughs> so 280 pounds, six foot tall with a 32 inch waist, and you don't have a weak body part. That is, if no. that's um, if that's not a contest winning physique, I don't know what is. You know what I mean? They just keep saying like, you know, if you pull down in that condition, dry yeah. and hard, it's a very hard combination, to, you know, it's something to beat. It's just something, and we know that, and because we know that we're making, I mean, I have to drop access, because last, even last year when doing the British, I came in slightly heavier and off, because we're trying to make sure we hit that way. This year is completely differently. Yeah. I'm dialing in as, as dry and as hard as I can. And I'm pulling them, you know, really going for condition first more than size. Mm. Because I know previous years, it's always been a case of, okay, you gotta be a slightly bigger, you gotta be slightly bigger. Mm. So last year was the first year where I competed and it was the first time I get on stage and everyone was like, whoa, okay, he's big enough. Yeah. So that was, that was, it's no longer in the back of my mind anymore. Now it's a case of, okay, you have to bring in that tight condition. You know, regardless of how big you are, you have to be in condition. Mm. Even if it means you got to lose a bit more size to bring in a condition, that's what you have to do. Yeah. So this year is all, that's where the focus has shift, completely shifted to, Good. is bringing as tight as hard as you can. And, you know, that's exactly what the goal is this year. Right. This is a question I, um, I'm interested to ask as a British bodybuilder. I want you to know, I want to know, sometimes like I've spoke to Nathan Diasha and, and and certain athletes will set a gauge in their head of like, he wants to beat Dexter because he said that's the next step up for him as an athlete. He has someone he's competed against many times, but never beaten. Do you concern yourself about where you rank as a British bodybuilder? And does it, does it motivate you? And like, are you wanting to chase, chase say Nathan Diasha to a contest just so you can try and beat him? 
Oh, yeah. I mean, we all know as a British, the thing is with the British scene, we can all act and say when we're on interviews that politely and say, oh, no, I just want to bring my best. I just want to be the best. Yeah. Let's forget all that. We all know that it's a composition. We all know that we're just as competitive with each other. Yeah. So if I'm looking at it, I'm thinking, okay, best guy in the UK, Nathan, mm-hmm. I'm going to beat him. Yeah. So any show that we're in next, my thought is, okay, I'm taking him out. Mm-hmm. Period. You know, same thing when we came to the British Grand Prix last year. Right from the minute we knew the show was going to happen, hmm. it was a case of okay, who's the big who's the big guy you got to be? Nathan is. So right now, yes, it is a case of I'm going to take out any British guy that's on that lineup, and then if any show I'm doing, if they say okay, who's I always do the same thing. I look at the best guy or the guy that's ranked the top at that lineup and say okay, he's the one to be. Okay, guess what? I'm coming for him with everything I got. Hmm. So I know that that is just a mindset I've always had. It will never change, even though it's the Olympia. It will still be the same mindset. I'll still be going to the Olympia looking at Brendan Curry and thinking. Okay, how much work do I need to do all year just to get past him? Yeah, you know, and this is the same mindset you. I know you have to have as an athlete. I don't. I don't mm-hmm. believe that there's any top athlete that doesn't have that same mindset. Well, look at look at Phil and Kai. I mean, I spoke to Phil about it, and he said he said, look, he says me and he says he said we were fierce rivals. He said, but people like Kai brought out the best in me. He says like 2013 exactly. when when he came second when Phil came. Uh, Phil and Kai were very very close in 2012. He said, Giles. He said after Kai came so close to me in 2012. He says. I went all out the next year. Like when yeah. Gunter beat Ronnie, it kind of brings the real champions, it brings out the best of something. Because I was thinking, when, when you came second to Nathan, you, you, beat oh, James, you beat James Holland's head, who's now really progressing yeah. as well. But like, I would yeah. imagine in your head as, a, as an athlete, as a needing a motivating or something to shoot for, I can imagine you oh, thinking, man. right, okay, I'm really, I'm so close to Nathan, I'm really going to be motivated the next year to take him out. Oh, yeah. I mean, you can imagine <laughs> yeah. that, you know, coming on the British stage and being that close. Yeah. You think to myself, damn, you know, if I'm if I could have done that much work and be that close, all it makes you do when you go back to gym is, OK, now nah, I'm going to kill myself yeah. to make sure I bridge that gap and I pass it. So yeah. it is motivating, you know, mm-hmm. as much as people try to obviously play the, oh, the political game and be like, oh, you know, I just want to go against myself and be better than I was last time. That can only motivate you so much. Mm. The idea of rivalry, the idea of looking at people and going, you know, I got to get past him, I got to get past him, I got to beat him, it pushes you to the next level. It pushes you to the next level. It makes you break past your limit. Because I know in the gym, that motivates me when I go there and go, okay, right, whatever weakness I have, I have to look at a guy that has the strongest power and go, look, I got to work just as hard as him, or if not harder, just to pass him next time. So what about all the improvements James Holland's head has made since you last competed? Because he's really, what is he, like 293 in pretty good condition at the moment? I mean, he's like yeah. someone like yourself. He's really on the rise. He's really he's really taking it to the next level. Are you, are you looking forward or wanting to compete against oh. him again? <laughs> you know, like me and James, there ain't no joke about it. Most people worry, no, but we have, we do have a rivalry going, and so far it's two one to to me. So yeah, yeah of course, I'm I'm gonna keep making that. And James already said himself, like he knows that we're both gonna be battling back and forth for a while, and I'm gonna make sure he never beats me again. I've already told him that. <laughs> That's what he I want to make sure you never beat me again, ever. Yeah. So I know he's in the gym and he's killing himself to try to make sure that he <laughs> catches me next time. I maybe might be the British this year, yeah. but I'm t- I've already told you. You know, front lines. You ain't never beating me again, and that's how, that's how he's gonna be. You know, uh, so yeah. I think I think obviously we had, sadly we had to cancel the uh, the British Grand Prix this year. That was a. Yeah. I think we we're all looking forward to seeing a lot of the because there was quite a few British guys, Jamie, uh, Jamie, uh, oh, Jamie the Giant. Um, uh, yep. You know, Luke, Nathan. A lot of people were down to do it, and it obviously it had to be cancelled. So. I mean, it was really, I, I'm, I'm excited for next year. And I hope a lot of the British guys like Zach Khan, I really hope they all jump in because we really want to see, you know, there's that because the thing is British bodybuilding has just absolutely exploded in the last few years. I know obviously this year we had the terrible, tragic loss of Luke Sandow, but you know, that there, there's just, it was, it was a huge loss, but there's so many, there's so many sort of good athletes in the UK you know, I think mm-hmm. it's. Um, I think it's. Uh, I think we really. I think there is a real question of who the best in Britain is now. You know. All right. Yeah. I mean, the scene right now, the British scene is just going crazy right now. I think it's bringing out a lot of rivalries. It's bringing out a lot of just that old school training mentality and everything else coming out of all of us. Mm. And obviously, the unfortunate event with Luke this year, it shook us. It yeah. shook all of us to our core. It really did. Mm. You know, I don't think there's any British bodybuilder that didn't feel that pain of it. Yeah. You know. But, you know, we just, we're going to carry on doing what we're doing and obviously pushing that barriers and pushing that boundaries even more. Mm. But right now, British bodybuilding scene is strong and it's getting stronger each year. Mm. And, you know, if any, if the Americans and all them, if they're not watching their back, 
they'll be shocked the next time British guys jump on stage. Mm. You know, this year was going to be a shock for them. But unfortunately, with this, it really yeah. worked all of us out. Because this year, I, we were gunning for them hard. Yeah. You know? <laughs> we're saying this year, you know, if there's any show that comes out this year and you have any British guy in that lineup, pay very close attention to what they bring mm. because we really are running hard for them this year so what you know? so what shows are you planning what with everything say everything goes ahead as planned what yeah. shows are you looking to do and uh, uh, well this year well for me is right now this year is if tampa happens i'm jumping in tampa okay if that is not possible the next show i think is south korea or whatever if it's possible for me to get on that stage i'll get on that stage <laughs> if that doesn't happen if it's Portugal, I think it's after that. If that happens, if that comes in, then I'll get on that. I will just keep going until I finally get a show to do. Yeah. Because it's been a long year. Um, mm. Believe me, I've been at the worst. I've been at my lowest point where it's just been completely, you know, down on the dumps thinking, is this ever going to happen? Mm. So we've kind of, I have, I have to pick myself up. And I mean, thank God for all this, my partner, the team I have around me. Mm. They've been very motivated telling me to come on, just keep going, keep going, you know, so, yeah. and say, look, if you can have to prep all year, prep all year, but if you get a show, you will be, we will get to you in a show. So right now the mentality is, I don't know what show will be the first show that I'm allowed to do, but whatever show it is, I'll be in it. No. I'm very curious if you do Tampa and you manage to get to Tampa I'm very I, I'm really excited to see you go up against Ian Valier and Hunter Labrada oh yeah that's oh, yeah. gonna you be know, a, well, that's gonna be a good call gonna out be, yeah that's gonna oh, be yeah. Yeah, awesome and I, I'm you know you can just imagine how excited I am to actually believe to be in Atlanta right now yeah. and how I'm chopping at the bit at the same time you know I'm crossing my fingers and think please <laughs> come on man just get me there all I want to do is just stand there I'll you know, swim I'll swim if I have to like, <laughs> you know Come on, just, you know, and I'm really, really excited to get in that lineup yeah. so badly. And I'm thinking, come on, man, it's going to be an exciting one. That's for sure. Especially being the first show back after all this is done. Yeah. So you, I, you want to look for. Samson, you seem in very, very good spirits. And I know it's, you, you explain, you've been saying you, you had a tough year. What was the hardest, hardest part of this year? What was, what, what, what was it? And how did you kind of pull yourself out of it? Man. It's been everything. The thing is, fair enough, with the coronavirus and everything being on lockdown, it's been hard for everybody. Yeah. I've been, I got to put myself in one of the lucky category because, because of, I work in construction, I work in a care, in a care home. Part of, part of my job is basically doing construction for care homes. We never got the chance. Our job carried on through the lockdown. So, oh, I've been okay. working. so it, for many fitness people, because the gym closed and all the businesses, it dried up. You know, and they've, they're in a lot more worse spot than I am. But because I don't work my full-time job in the fitness industry, I was able to carry on working either way. Okay, so okay. on that part, it worked well for me. Then I was lucky enough as again to have someone who owned a gym that could say, here you go, mate, you use that. Yeah, yeah. So training-wise, I've been good in that part. But I tell you what, man, this year, when I got the message about, I, was, I know I finished work, and I saw this post that said something's happened to Luke. Right, and I didn't, I didn't believe it, and I completely dismissed it. I thought like, oh, somebody's trying to play some stupid ass joke. Mm. So I remember driving and out to the gym, kind of just thinking, yeah, it's nothing. I called my missus. I go, did you see this post? And she said, yeah, I see that now. It's probably just you know someone messing around. Yeah. So I got to the gym and I spoke to the owner at the time. You know, spoke to Chris, and I didn't even speak to him. As soon as I got there, he was like, he was started saying something, and I overheard him. And I was like, are you guys talking about Luke? And he said, yeah. Have you, did you not hear it? And I was like, yeah, I thought I heard something, but it's just a game, right? It's not, it's not real. And they were like, yeah, there might be something serious about it. And immediately after that, phone, after that my phone starts ringing mm. and everything starts pinging off. Yeah. And I saw that and believe me, I actually, it crushed me immediately in the spot. I was in tears in the most were you, part. Were you and Luke, obviously we're all in the scene and stuff in the UK, you know, for the sake of the American viewers, but were you close to Luke or? We were never that close. We weren't close like that. I mean, we had... But it um, affected um, you. We had obviously the rivalry and everything else. And at one yeah. point, we were running the website for muscle, uh, for uh, the muscle uh, thing, uh, muscle that we we're doing. But in terms of obviously close, we weren't close that, but we were just—it was almost like admiration from a distance. Yeah. So when when it happened, it was it was a it was just a shock to everybody. And at that point, he just basically knocked me on my feet. And I just I remember just not training that day and just going in the car and just driving home because I was like I just couldn't put face it. Yeah. And I just it was it was really kind of like a shock to me. And I think coming back from that, it was hard. And that I can imagine, you know, imagine imagine what James must be going through and all them guys that were a lot more closer to him, what they might have been going through. But it was seriously it was something else, you know. But how, that was definitely how did it um how did it affect you? Did it make you ch think about <laughs> life differently or your body or your career differently I mean, or just everything? 
You see, the thing with me, I don't like talking, obviously with me, I don't always try to talk to myself too much like a victim and everything like that. But being someone who has been through depression and struggles and fights with that every, you know, every so often, and I never like drawing that to light because I never want it to ever define me. So I never draw that to attention. But I know what it's like to struggle, especially when the lockdown and everything happened and yeah. you started to see things fall apart around life with it. It did make me feel, you know, completely down. And obviously you start feeling that them thoughts coming back in your head and everything else. And, you know, you try to just muster through it and just, not, you know, talk about it as much as you can with my loved ones and try to get through it. But when that happens in the brink of all that, mm. with someone who's going through that fight as well, it, it really does hit you in a negative way, you know. It really does hit you hard and you look at it and go, and, damn. I, I, I think it was the, um, I think it was pre, I think the biggest was the shock the, because yeah. this is a guy he just signed in. You know, I was I, I had dinner with him and John Thurston at the uh, the Dorian Yates sem- um, uh, premiere in in October in Birmingham, and he we were walking out of the hotel and he says, "Giles, I've just been signed five years of Redcon." I said, "Mate, you don't get contracts for five years anymore." I said, "They must have so no. much faith in you." you he know. says, "I'm moving into my dream house. Me and me, and, you know, me and my partner." He says, "Where would you know? We're so happy. Yeah. We're moving in together. We got a new little dog, and you know, and it was just um." It, it just, I think because we didn't, you know, it wasn't, it wasn't someone that was, you know, he was always happy when you saw him. So to hear that yeah. that happened, it was such an out of the blue thing. No one saw that coming because everyone was like, whoa, that was, that did not see that coming at all, you no. know? So Because, I mean, the funny thing is like the Monday before, yeah. because I know you have a, I was talking to him. We were messaging back and forth. I was and on the we Monday as well. I got texts off him on yeah, the Monday. You know, yeah, yeah. And we were talking about the British Grand Prix and everything yeah. else. And we were obviously back and back up, you know, I'm, I'm going to kick your ass this year, blah, blah, blah. <laughs> and yeah. going back and forth at it. Mm-hmm. And it was kind of like, okay. And then you got that a few days later. And you just like, you couldn't, you just didn't, you couldn't believe it. You just, yeah. you did not, you did not. It's like, no, nah, it can't be. It's not possible, you know. And it really, you know, it really does kind of hit home, you know, how, you know, when someone can show this image of themselves all the time, yeah. you know, the happy go lucky, they obviously, you know, look like nothing bothers you, how much actually really goes on behind the scene or what's really behind that. Point. And it just kind of gives you that much respect of actually respect for people and actually understanding that there's a lot more to every book than, you know, what you see in the cover, mm. for sure. That's for sure, you know. I think it was absolutely wonderful how the industry spoke up and everyone kind of reached out to each other and i know so many people like um like i rang banji demeji and james hollands had i left him a voice note i rang john uh i think and everyone was doing from what i can gather when i spoke to them everyone was doing the same everyone was ringing each other and checking in on each other and you know and, mm-hmm. and it, it kind of helps you know like certain people reconnect um um nathan messaged me and he was like nathan diashi messaged me and he was like i I hadn't spoke to him for a couple of months and he was just you know we we started speaking you know quite frequently and and it was just i think another way that they they all came forward with the um you know the money for his children you know with the the gofundme and all that i I think it was i think it was really like i thought it was really like um reassuring and kind of quite a beautiful thing how everyone Mm -hmm. really kind of stepped up and really sort of spent and and really, like, he, he really touched people all over the world. I mean, he really did. People... He really did. He really did. Yeah. You know, and he really did kind of push us to train harder to kind of catch that, you know, obviously the idea of it and everything else. You watch, we always say, okay, when you talk about guys that are training hard, you always put, you know, him and James are always one of them guys that you're thinking, okay, in the British scene, you're like, yeah, you got to beat them. Them guys, they train yeah, hard. Yeah, yeah, they ain't slacking, do they? They always match that scene, you know. Yeah, yeah. And so it was always something that's always been there. I mean, you know, me and Luke and James would come right from the amateur scene from the, doing the British Yes. All the way to where we are now. Twenty seventeen, so, you know, wasn't it? 2017. in twenty seventeen, we all shared the stage at the same time with Joe Harlan yeah. and the rest of the other guys. So, it it really is kind of like you know seeing that whole process build and all of yeah. us grow at the same time. Yeah. You know, so it, it it was it kind of it did feel hard and it did feel personal and it did feel kind of like damn, you just you know you just have to deal with it, but it's not easy mm. at all. Okay, let's um, for the sake of the American viewers, who would you say are the six best British bodybuilders, pros right now? Who are the ones that really you oh, think man. have really got potential? The ones that are really going to be, you know, um, being a threat internationally? Uh, so, obviously, we already got Nathan Deasha. Yep, yourself. He's already, he's already claimed, he's already said that self so up. You, you uh, and Nathan? J- me and Nathan, obviously, you know, around that point. Yep. Uh, James Holly said, without a doubt, you know, um, Jamie Joe Howe, another one coming up, mm-hmm. you know, uh, Mark Hector. Yes, Mark one. Hector. Yeah, yeah, Mark he's, Hector. Yeah, yeah. He's coming up he's, fast. He's, he's, 
is going to be a good one. Um, I think someone they got to speak about, I don't know what he's doing right now, Jim Nazib. Jim, oh, yeah, yeah, because he, he turned pro a couple yeah, of years ago and it was, always, yeah, he's kind of yeah. disappeared, isn't he's he? A, he's a big guy. He's big, big dude. Guy as well. I think he's coming back in his scene as well and he's another one to kind of watch out for as well. It's and like then obviously you've got, the you got the younger guys, obviously the Kobu, um, I can't remember the dude's name as well, uh, Harris, Harrison, is it Harris? Who? Uh, oh, it's Harrison oh, Harris. Oh, yeah, yeah. Oh. Don't want to say his and name. then obviously, yeah. oh, without a doubt, you know, without a doubt, I think the most dangerous guy depends on what he does because he's he's in a very difficult position right now. Mm -hmm. Rob Taylor. Oh, Rob Taylor. Yeah, uh, yeah. Oh man, if Rob is in a very difficult position because he's not quite tall enough to be an open guy. Right. Okay. At the same time, he's just between that open and two twelve guy. What is he like five six so, or something? Yeah. 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 You know? Yeah. And he is insanely dense, insanely conditioned, mm. and. He's just in that point where he, I think, for him to make two twelve is a struggle. He's a right. big struggle from that, so, that point. He, so he's kind of like, um, he's kind of like the Ronnie Raquel. Um, who else? Yeah. It's like Hidetada. Yeah. Well, Hidetada made but yeah. the guys that are kind of like ready two twenty, yeah. two twenty five, and then they're under yeah, exactly. sacrifice muscle. It's, there you go, and that's yeah, where he is yeah. at right now. But he is a very dangerous bodybuilder. Yeah. You know, it's another one you got to watch out for. He's very dangerous, and I think he was planning on competing this year. I think he was planning on doing the show in Ireland before the whole thing. Kind of went went south and everything else. Well, that would have been two twelve, wouldn't it? Yeah, he would have. I think I'm he went because he did think about doing two twelve then. Yeah. And yeah. I'm, last time I spoke to him, he was saying, okay, maybe he will jump in the open or whatever. But I don't know what his plans are in the future. But he's basically has to make that decision. But whatever he does make, he will be a very dangerous person to look out for. I, that's I, for sure. I think if you're in that position, because I thought Sasan should have gone two twelve the first year. When he turned pro oh, yeah. twenty fifty, I thought the year after, I thought I thought he should do one year as a two twelve, and then. But he's someone who managed to just push himself up to about two thirty and be and be competitive yeah. as an open. But I think I think Sasson is a bit taller than Rob. Yeah, I think he's just a little bit taller than Rob. So yeah. you know, and Rob is already maxed. I mean, his physique is pretty much just filled out. So yeah. it's kind of like okay, you know, it will be an interesting one to see what he goes on. And obviously, if Sass, I don't obviously know what's going on with Sasson. I, I think. Know, as if was, well, he's had a baby, you know, isn't he? He's had a baby. Yeah. So, you know, if he's going to come back or not. But if he does, obviously, he's another one to kind of look out for. Mm. But hey, I'm holding on and I'm going, I'm, I'm, I'm just looking forward to trying to pass Nathan. So, <laughs> yes. I just, my focus, I just keep my focus on there, you know. Yeah, and then yeah. If anybody's yeah. coming around the way, I'm just, I'm going to look, hey, if you're trying for me, I'm going to try to beat you to get past you as well. So, I mean, I. Me, yeah, I mean, we know Nathan's very, very confident, and he's got every right to be because he's got six pro wins. Oh, right. He's been seventh. Of course, of course. He's been seventh at Olympia. He's pushed. He's, there's a couple of times when he could have beat Roly, who's like a top three Olympia yeah. guy. But I tell you what, that Nate, when that when you took second to him at the um, the British Grand Prix, and like you said, you could have been crisper. Like the yeah. fact that it was like you know you were bringing you two out together, I bet that must have caused him a a, a bit of a you know a sweaty <laughs> yep. forehead. <laughs> yep, and I'm you can't imagine how well I'm looking forward for us to get on stage again. Yeah, how much I'm looking forward to that. I'm like, oh, when they said the bridge was going to happen this year already, I'm like, yes, okay, <laughs> yeah. yes, let's go again. Yeah, and then he said, oh, he's already qualified. He wasn't planning on doing it. But I'm thinking, come on, man, just. Mm. Get on the stage. Let's go again. <laughs> but you know, but I'm thinking. I don't know what stage you we we're gonna meet up. But whatever it is, you best believe my eyes on target on that one. I've got a feeling you're gonna chase him to a show. I feel I'm gonna feeling oh, he's gonna announce yeah. the show, and you're gonna be like, right, I'm doing that one. I'm doing that one. Even yeah. if it be a case of I'm very qualified for the Olympia. I'm ready to go. I'm like, yeah, yeah. And then people like, oh, I'll probably jump in the show. I'm like, yeah, I'm doing it too. Good. Yeah, come on, let's go. And we'll also, and also, guys, if you don't know, um, if, if you're new to Samson, it's the first time you've heard about him. He's a very, very, very good poser. Now, are you, are you still putting as much effort into your posing routines and all your and 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 and, and improving and and thinking of new yeah. ideas? Because you know, as like I said before in the past, you know, my idea of bodybuilding has always been from the guys from the nineties. You know, the Sean Ray, Flex Wheelers, Kevin. Those guys, they put particularly, it's not just in one part of bodybuilding. They focus bodybuilding as a whole, as an element of it. And as much as, obviously, you try to improve your physique, you have to and do everything you have to bring your, your weak parts up and everything else. But the point of presentation is always a powerful thing that you always have to have under your belt. Yep. And my idea is, and most shows, I know most shows, as soon as I get on stage, it's not the overwhelming size or, or shape or whatever, but it's the fact that it's to draw attention from everybody else that people mm. just look at the way you move and they completely can't take their eyes off you mm. that comes from posing it comes from the way you move how smooth you do it and that old whole meticulousness is what i try to always constantly work on yeah you know 
and obviously the way you presented with the vacuum and how to hit the poses and how to move to draw attention from other athletes so the judges constantly are just looking at you yeah. and your movement and everything else and they're intrigued by that you know, and I, I think if I was to describe you your physique to someone who hadn't seen what you look like on stage I would say you're like a six foot blend of Chris Cormier and Lee Haney yeah just, that, uh, you'd a, little, just a little a little bit more lap thickness and then you'd be like yeah. a very like uh, well you, yeah you've got very good arms as well i think uh, that's i think the combination of those two kind of physiques i think that was and also with the 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 really flamboyant really good decent posing you know with good transitions yeah thank you thank you but yeah i mean that's the same sort of images i like to work on and obviously that's where the era of baby i watch and i kind of try to embody and like pronounce and obviously i love i love kai green you know so obviously with kai then he's you know, he's dynamic and he's different from everybody yeah. else. That that idea of it. So I watch him a lot and I take a get a lot of inspiration from him. So when people watch my pros routine, mm. they always say, Oh, did you did you did you get that from Kai? Do you know? I was like, Yeah, because I do I I've, 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 I've seen I've seen some of these guys. Yeah, I've seen yeah. I've seen like uh, elements of Sean Ray, Kevin Navrone, Flex Wheeler, yeah. Kai Green. I've seen and you I'm Melvin Anthony and you've kind of blended yeah. all of them together and you've added and your own is, kind of flavour to it, you and know? This is and this is exactly what I like to do. I like yeah. to get on stage and you have guys that haven't watched body for so long and then they see you on stage and they start looking and they start reminiscing going, oh, there's a bit of this in it. This is a bit of... And, yeah, you yeah. know, they can see all these little things from different athletes that they've always looked at back in the day and thinking, oh, and they just, you know, just bringing back that reminder of what them guys stood for and try to embody all of that in one physique and one showing every time you get on stage where he reminds a lot of people what different parts of bodybuilding that they actually like and parts that I basically represent sort of thing. So, yeah, it kind of works for me in that way. Good. Okay, let's keep it on a British theme. How do you think Flex Lewis is going to do at the Mr. Olympia this year? Oh, man. <sighs> That's... <sighs> If Phil and Rodin don't come back, yeah, I I say he's got pretty much a ninety nine percent chance of winning it. Winning it? Wow. Yeah. Why? Uh, because Why? I, because conditioning. You there's no one who's going to come close in open class. I'm sorry, but there just isn't. He day might, but Flex has already been he day before. Hadi. He's gonna. I mean, Hadi Hadi before. Yeah, yeah. He's already done that. He's more complete. Hmm. He's more dense. If he comes in slightly bigger, I just as much as Brandon is impressive and everything else, it'll be it'll be you have it's something that you want to see them stand next to each other, okay. you know. And I think yeah, but don't forget Brandon's people. Brandon had to peak twice last year because he won the Arnold yeah. Classic and, and and as it's been proved with um, Ronnie Coleman, uh, J, J, Jay Cutler, he's like to, to peak twice in a year for two big shows. He's I mean, like, hard. Brandon arguably looked better yeah. at the Arnold Classic, but he was bigger at the Olympia. So, um, okay, then. You've got an all-time best William Bonac, uh, Vancouver condition Hadi Chupin, and you've got a 225-pound Flex Lewis. Who wins? <laughs> Honestly, I wouldn't know. I wouldn't know. Come on. Because I think that one is something you have to see. Oh, okay. Because the thing is, if you have to see that, because we've never seen them guys all stand next to each other. Yeah. You know, and there's all things you can see this video from this part or there from this show and this show and try to put it together in your head. But we all know bodybuilding, that's easy to do. Mm -hmm. That's something. It's when they stand next to each other, that's when you truly can judge. You can't judge them through different stages and different times. <laughs> oh, and damn. And you have to all stand together. Okay. And I think when that happens, that's when you can truly say, okay, help. Okay. This guy's winning. This guy's, you know, who's not who he is. Okay, complete, so think, yeah, to completely disregard what you've just said there, 20, yeah. <laughs> 2080, 2018 Sean Roden, Mr. Olympia winner, 2019 Olympia Brandon Curry, who wins? <laughs> okay, without, <laughs> without, without, without trying to offend nobody. You won't offend anyone, Sean they Roden. they don't mind. No, uh, I would say Sean Roden would have taken that. Okay. I think Sean Roden would take that. Okay. You know, I think what we saw in Sean Roden in 2018, I think it was more or less just jaw dropping when he walked out. And he was like, whoa, that was a level of conditioning that we just kind of like, I mean, the guy was, he was almost see-through. He was like, yeah. wow, he, he was, he wore his skin was inside out. He just, he's like, wow, okay. So I think that, you know, yeah, I think that would be very hard to say, say otherwise. I think, yeah, Sean Rodin would have been a Okay, then Samson, is there anyone you want to quickly thank or any sponsors or anything or any, 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 any people in your team uh, you'd like to mention? Yeah, I just always my partner, Mel, and my coach. She's obviously been coaching me through this whole time and just keeping me positive through this whole time and everything else. Mm. And Chris Jones, 
I had a second man in, in hand and mm-hmm. he's obviously really pushed me through this whole period. Good. Training at his gym and he's really kind of making me step up to the next level nice. and making make sure that I bring the next condition, the next level of conditioning as well. So those two guys, yeah, you know, I, 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 I couldn't thank them enough, truly. Okay. So yeah, whatever package I bring to the stage is here, you better believe that that's the result of their work, their hard work. We're coming with more size and definitely going to be the best condition I've ever been. I so, honestly, if you can bring 270 shredded to the Tampa, oh, I think you could win it, mate. All right, oh, definitely. Serious. That's why he has to be there. That's why he's got to. Yeah, please let him get to America. <laughs> yeah, he's got a he's got a first place check. He needs to needs to cash. Oh yeah. Get him to the loop. Especially going up against them two guys, you know, obviously Ian Valley and and freaking Hunter Lavada, because yeah. that's gonna be yeah, I'm a, I'm already looking forward to that one. Yeah, and it's always a good atmosphere at the Tampa show. I went in twenty seventeen and in the year after when Sergio was up against Sergio Oliva Jr. was up against Alexis Rivera and the the place yeah. was just erupting. I mean it's a really good it's it's run by Tim Gardner and he's a fantastic player and he always manages to generate such a good atmosphere at his show. So I think you've picked a really good yeah. if you can get there, mate, you've picked a really good good show to do that one in america so i think that's going to be a really exciting one so yeah samson i really wanted because um, i said i saw that um the update and i was like oh samson's looking good i think we'll have to get him back on global muscle so uh <laughs> always good to catch up mate and um, i'm really that's rooting for you for this year mate i'm really excited to see what you're going to bring see the posing routine you know coming in bigger and better with still keeping the aesthetics i think that's something i think the the american fans are going to love to see mate Thank you, thank you very much. Yes. So, yeah, five weeks time. We're about to find out. So, yeah, excited. Okay. All right, then, Samson. Um, good luck with the prep next five weeks. And fingers right, crossed you. you can get to Tampa, mate. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Samson. Thank you. And welcome back to MD Global Muscle here at the On The Rise Media Studio with me, your host, Giles Thomas. And we are joined for part two of the Sean Roden interview. 2018, Mr. Olympia, Sean Roden! Yay! <laughs> Sean, thank you for joining us yes. once again, mate. Oh, thank you. This is amazing. <laughs> yeah, that sounded good. Uh, so how have you been, mate? How are you? How have you been this week? What have you been up to? You know, it's it's a great week, man. You know, we um, you know, my daughter's thirty minutes away with her with her mom. Mm-hmm. You know, so we spend a lot of time, you know, driving to Santa Barbara to, you know, just hang out and you know, I mean, it's, it's amazing. You know, I, I posted a picture last night. <laughs> yeah. And, you know, that was just me having, you know, um, a daddy moment. You know, where. You know, those are the, the moments that people understand that are just, you know, priceless. You know, it doesn't matter what, to me, it doesn't matter what you've accomplished, how much you've accomplished. Um, when it comes to just being with your family, especially being with your daughter, or just being with your kids, you know, that's, mm. like, nothing could ever replace that. Um, you know, so me and Laura, we drive up and, you know, we hang out with Michelle Max and my daughter and, you know, we just hang out at your house and, yeah, that was, you know, I uh, Laura and Michelle is off doing their girl thing and you know it's just me and my daughter just doing stuff like that yeah <laughs> I, I um I interviewed Brad Rowe earlier on and he was saying uh, he was talking about you and he was saying uh, that I said does do you see Sean much in uh, Gold's Gym anymore and he says no he's moved because he wants to be closer to his daughter so was that was that the main reason you moved so you could be like physically closer to your daughter to see her more often yeah because, you know um it's rough, man. Like, you know, even, you know, getting ready for the Olympia in 2018, mm-hmm. uh, I was driving, you know, I was driving back and forth to, from Santa Barbara to LA to train. Mm-hmm. And it, it would take sometimes two and a half hours to get to LA. And when I started um, just being in LA a lot more, and when I moved to LA, um, it became even more of trying to, instead of driving from Santa Barbara to LA, it became even more for me driving after training to Santa Barbara because I was always in traffic. Mm. So it would take me even longer to get there. And then I would drive back to LA and, you know, you know, after a long day of training, you oh. like, you're just falling asleep and yeah. you know, I'm driving with the windows down and <laughs> water, I'm having the AC on and, 
you know, so in December, I remember we, um, you know, I drove to Santa Barbara with Lara and we come, you know, to this little town called Oxnard. And I was like, you know what, man? And this would be so much easier, <laughs> like if we just move from um, from LA. Mm -hmm. And so we we started looking. Um, is this start? You know, we, we see some really nice house, and like, wow, this is really nice. And like, you know, the price compared to living in LA, yeah. house of LA is astronomical. And you know, fortunately, we found a. Uh, brand new house that was you know still being built in the development mm -hmm. um our development was still being built and um like within man i want to say within a week of looking or a week and a half and um and it was funny because i was getting ready to go to the philippines for my show the sean roden classic mm -hmm. and i uh i had literally like a day and a half <laughs> to pack everything up. Oh, Lard really? Went back, Lard went back to Canada. So it took me a day and a half of packing everything up. Yeah. Calling a moving company to come in. But I wanted to make sure that when they came, like, I knew I was pressed for time. So I packed my clothes because I knew by the time I moved, I was literally going to be driving back to LA to get to the airport. Mm -hmm. So I packed and wrapped everything up. And the moving company came. They were like, "Oh," and I'm like, "Yeah, all I need for you guys to do is take it to the truck and deliver yeah, yeah. it." Fantastic. And uh, they were a shot because they were like, "Wow, we normally come and we have X amount of hours that we have to work." I was like, "I really don't care about the hours. Like, I really need to get a flight back tomorrow." Yeah. And I just need for you guys to get this to my new house. Um, but you know, I'm thankful because it's 30 minutes away and. Mm -hmm. You know, instead of me driving two and a half hours, two hours, it makes it so much easier for me to just, we could just hop in the car and sometimes there's no traffic in less than 30 minutes in Santa Barbara. Fantastic. So how often do you see your daughter? Every week or every two weeks or how often? I see her pretty much whenever we want. Oh, that's good. Uh, sometimes, you know, three, four times a week. Um, that's that's the beauty of that because, again, mm. it's, you know, it's 30 minutes away compared to two and a half hours where, you know, we go and see her, you know, maybe twice a week, but now mm. being in such close proximity, you know, if we're not doing anything or they come down here and hang out or we go up there and hang out with them. So mm. you know, it's, it's a lot easier. What's the favorite thing you do together? Tea parties. <laughs> <laughs> uh, also, also, Sean, Sean, I'm actually going to find that footage I commented on this morning because you said, yeah, well, doubt now, Giles, you see what I wear when uh, when I'm at home. <laughs> Um, I'm actually going to put this footage in, so I'm, I'm really disappointed you're wearing your cap today and not what you were wearing last night. <laughs> That's my daddy's outfit. I, I only wear that <laughs> off camera. <laughs> you know, but you know what? Um, there's so many things. I know everybody bragged about their kid, like how smart their kids are, what, but my, my daughter is beyond her age and smart. Like, um, even just going to the grocery store, people, and I sometimes find myself saying, I can't believe I'm talking to my four-year-old daughter. Oh, she's four. She's four. Year -old because you have, I have grown up conversation with her. I, I talk to her like I'm talking to you right now. Wow. Like she would go, so guys, how was your day? And you can't <laughs> just say, oh, it was good. Yeah. You have to tell her what you did. Yeah. She'd be like, so, and so what did you do? She'd be like, well, I interviewed Sean. What did Sean say? <laughs> yeah, yeah. You know, so even just walking around the grocery store there sometimes, I'm like, so, sweetie, do you think we should get the chicken or the beef? And she goes, well, we should get the beef, you know? And Yeah. But I find myself having those conversations with her and sometimes just forget that I'm actually talking to, you know, my four-year-old daughter. Um, yeah, but we, I mean, there's so many things that we do, you know, besides just, you know, tea party. Some days we'll play that. <laughs> um bad. I'm taking her to school. <laughs> okay. <laughs> and um, I guarantee you this much. She'll probably be, and this year our daughter is, uh, father's a bodybuilder, but she's one of the few kids that I know that favorite meal is salmon and rice. Salmon and rice. Yeah. So she's a, <laughs> so she's a clean eater. <laughs> <laughs> salmon and rice. But, uh, White fish and rice. Wow. Uh, if I'm eating 
ground beef and rice. Yeah. That's what you want to eat. Like, <laughs> Brilliant. There's those, hey, can I have some nuggets? Can I have, yeah. you know, or cream of rice? Cream of rice, um, protein powder, and almond butter. <laughs> like, okay. Yeah, it's, you know, and that's what made my prep a lot of times easy because mm. I didn't have to stray because if she see me, she goes, Daddy, can you make some cream of rice? And I'm like, uh, okay, <laughs> you know. So. Yeah. That's that's so yeah, part. so when, when, imagine you're prepping for the Olympia and she's saying, uh, you know, and you're saying, do you want a Domino's? And she's like, no, just salmon and broccoli with some soy sauce, please, Dad. You know, that's great. Like, like pretty much, yes, sir. She's like, no, you know, I have some cream of rice. And I'm like, or she goes, can you make that thing, that rice thing? And I'm like, what? She goes, the, the cream of rice and protein powder. Protein and powder. you have to like shake your head because you're like, hmm. Maybe I should just think of McDonald's. <laughs> yeah, but Sean, does she <laughs> do it? Does she do it because she sees the way that Daddy eats, or does she do it because you've taught her about nutrition, or what? Why? I never thought her about nutrition. I always told myself that she's a kid. Yeah, you can't. You know, at that age, the last thing you want to do is talk about nutrition. Yeah, no, you know, you'd be like, well, don't eat this and eat that or yeah. diet, you know. But I guess from her just watching me eat, you mm. know, you know, it doesn't matter what it is. She was like, you know, you could make a plate of something for her. And she's like, uh, I want to eat what daddy's eating. <laughs> that's, yeah, so that's, <laughs> that's the stuff I'm saying. It's like she's obviously seen so, you and thought, yeah, I'm okay. Happy. I mean, yeah. I'm happy, but half the time she eats more of my food than I eat. Yeah. You know, where she like generally enjoy it. Because she's like, Dad, you know what? If I grow fish, she's like, I want the crispy part of the fish. Yeah. And it's just she'll just go to town, you know, if I'm eating salmon, she wants salmon, mm. you know, even if I go to a restaurant, she goes, can I, I have salmon, um, calamari and spinach. <laughs> Fantastic. <laughs> that is good. Cause I mean, childhood obesity and all these things, you know, and like all yeah. these health issues with the, the, the global, I think that's so great that kids want to actually, you know, eat good, clean, healthy food. I think that that's so refreshing to hear, Sean. I, I tell you this much, like, you know, um, Laura and uh, my uh, daughter's mom were working out in the living room um, on Thursday, mm -hmm. on Friday. And um, we were playing and she just got up and run into the room and, you know, picked up like a two and a half pound dumbbell and was like in the midst. I, I, <laughs> I wish I could post this video because it's hilarious. Mm -hmm. Cause she's like in the mix, like whatever they were doing, she wanted to do yeah and i'm just like you know what i never have to sit down and teach her about exercise because <laughs> it's something that she generally wants to do yeah that's great that's great that's that's wonderful to hear sean that's really good to hear um before you mentioned your uh sean roden classic in the philippines that was um that was the show because i've had your friend sibu sisu catello sibu sisu yeah sibu that's my boy. Yeah, and he spoke. We had him on the show. And we put, I put him in my, in my MD column, and I've um, I put him in another show I was in, and he was because I thought this guy's a because he looks he kind of like the same sort of mold, kind of similar physique. I mean, you two could be brothers, and uh, I just thought this guy has got so much potential, and he he turned pro at your show, didn't he? Yeah. So funny story. I went to South Africa. Mm -hmm. um, I was with one of my sponsor and. You know, we were there for a couple of days, and then I saw this kid, and I was like, I was like, wow, I don't know that pro. And everybody started laughing. And they go, pro? And I'm like, yeah, like, who's this Who's this dude? And they go, Simu? I'm like, yeah. I was like, man, are you sure he's not a pro? <laughs> so <laughs> they sent me his um, Instagram page. Yeah. And I looked at every single picture. Wow. On his page because I was so intrigued. I was like, mm. man, this guy is has so much potential. Like, I can't believe he's not a pro. Mm. So I just went to his page. Um, that night we went, we had a big dinner. And I'm sitting there and he comes walking in. <laughs> and I'm like, holy shit. What year was this? What year was this, Sean? Uh, 2017. Okay. Oh, wow. So, yeah. Okay. Yeah. I was like, holy crap. That's... That's Cebu. So I walked up and introduced myself. 
And <laughs> Hi, I'm he's Sean like, Roden. you know, oh, man, I'm <laughs> such a big fan, you know. And I was like, dude, I can't believe you're not a pro. Mm. He goes, are you serious? Get out of here. I'm like, no. I was like, I went through every single picture on your page. And he's like, there's no way. And I start telling him, I was like, okay. You know, and like May 26, you did the show. Mm-hmm. We were wearing some red trunks. Um, <laughs> and he's looking at me because he's like, why? I was like, this man. I was like, you have, you have a ton of potential. Yeah. And uh, I was like, here's my number. I was like, you know, you know, give me a call if you need help with anything. And he's like, are you serious? I'm like, anything. Mm. And I was like, listen, um, I was shown the Philippines. It's in December. Mm-hmm. I would love to help you. I said, well, wherever I can. And um, he's like, okay. So we went back and forth, you know, talking. And... Um, I bugged the crap out of him. <laughs> Did you? I, I bugged him. I'm yeah. talking to the point where I don't know if he, I was like, I hope he doesn't get annoyed. I would text him. <laughs> Did you send the application in? Like, you know, and I'm like, how's the diet? And um, but I never told anyone that I knew him at okay. my show. Okay. Because I, I didn't want to be one of those where. You know, people goes, oh, it's because you know him. I never told anybody. I never spoke to anybody to show that I know him. I just bugged him to the point where, like, listen, <laughs> you know, make sure that your application is in. And I was like, when, when you get there, let me know when you get there. Um, I'll, I'll, be, I'll come and help you with your post and to make sure that everything is right. And um, he's like, you know, man, oh, thank you so much. You showed up and, you know, me and Stan, you know, looked him over, mm-hmm. making sure he was okay. And um, we were like, okay. And he went out and he killed it. He did. And won the whole show. Until, yeah. And it wasn't until when he was on stage, mm-hmm. someone mentioned, they're like, you know, I, he started crying when he won. Yeah. And I got up on stage and, you know, I was giving him his pro card and, <laughs> Here's a picture just on stage, just, you know, yep. hugging and, you know, afterward they were like, oh my God, like we never knew that. Like you knew this guy, you never said anything. I was like, I didn't want it to be one of those. Or yeah. Anything. You know, it was something else. He could be your stunt double. <laughs> yes, he could. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So do you think, I mean, because he's still very young, isn't he? He's in uh, mid, late 20s. 24. 20, yeah, like 24, 25. He's like, yeah. So I mean, there's, you know, there's a guy that, <laughs> He's already like, look, I mean, if you squint, you know, you could see the, the silhouette that's very similar, the big legs and the nice flowing lines. And he's a bit of a, he's got a few tweaks to make to his physique. But I th- honestly, yeah. I think, I think a couple of years, I think he could be right up there. What do you think? He's going to be phenomenal. Yeah. Um, and just a genuine kid, you know. Mm. Uh, he came here before, um, he came to LA before one of his bro show because he was like, I would love to come in. You know, train with you, and you know, you know, go through some posing, and mm-hmm. he came, and you know, we went to train me him and stand, and what did he train? We trained um back, okay, and um we trained back one day with Charles. Yeah, we trained we trained back one day, mm-hmm. and then we trained shoulders another day. Wow, I bet he loved that. <laughs> yeah, it, it was it was like probably it was like man, this is probably one of the the greatest experience because you know, it was <laughs> we, it was because I don't listen I'm, I'm I know I'm Mr. Olympian and all that but at the end of the day I never used that or the fact that hey I'm one of the top bodybuilders in the world I never used that to look down on anyone as far as where they're at and where they're trying to go mm. and for him I think he was like he was shocked to see that we vibe like we're like some just some kids in the street yeah he wasn't like i know more than you you should do this Mm -hmm. you know we just we hang out we chit chat and nothing for him that was you know more than he could ever imagine Mm. instead of someone using like their status and who they are and what they've become yeah um for him he was more at ease yeah no he he spoke i've had had him i spoke to him a few and he spoke very highly of you and he said you know you really have uh, I put it in my collar about a year or two ago, maybe two years ago, and he says, now, Sean has really helped me. He's really mentored me. He's really reached out to me, and he really kind of acknowledged that. And I thought it was nice to, I thought it'd be nice to kind of ask you about that as well, because it's, uh, 
it's um you know especially if this kid does go all the way to the top you know it's, it's it'd be nice to see that you like kind of um you know jay did with phil in the early days you know and those that, that the kind of the, the 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 passing the mantle and stuff i like that i like to hear that you know the the best of the best because that that day where he's changed with you charles glass and and stan you know that's gonna he's gonna go home and he's gonna be firing on all cylinders because of something like that you know it's gonna mean the world to him you know it could be life-changing you know yeah, it's funny because he was just uh no we, we didn't we trained with um psycho chris psycho fitness yeah because i was training with him at the time and um but he was just kind of like because he came in and we were just like hey come on let's go you know and <laughs> Yeah. You know, same thing when, um, you know, when I got his number, he was like, I wasn't really expecting you to reach out as much as you did. Mm. But it'd be like one o'clock in the morning. I'll text him. <laughs> <laughs> I remember being in China and I'm texting him like, hey, did you send the application in? Yeah. He's like, what time is it? I'm like, it's like 1 a.m. <laughs> yeah. Like, You're checking on me. I'm like, yeah. Yeah. That's great. Also, um, in in this episode with Brad Rowe mentioned that you, um, I think you paid for his flight to Russia. You paid his expenses to Russia so he could compete. You told us about that. Um, it's something that I've done over the years um, for uh, a lot of athletes. And I, I do that. When I just started, my mentor, Yanni Schamberger. Yeah, Yanni. I wanted to go to the Arnold. Mm. And I didn't have any money. I was, you know, just got into bodybuilding. And Yanni said to me, listen, um, if you make your way to Ohio, I have somewhere for you to stay. Fantastic. So I drove with a bunch of guys I knew mm -hmm. going to Ohio to hang out with the uh, hockey team. <laughs> yeah. But it took me almost three days driving with those guys. <laughs> Wow. Okay. They, they stopped at every single college, university. <laughs> <laughs> but I was so determined. I was like, I don't care. I just need to get to Ohio. Yeah. And um, when I got there, you know, Yanni took me and introduced me to, man, just about every single distributor, vendor, you name it. Yeah. And I was so overwhelmed and in awe. Because I'm like, wow, like people don't normally do this. Mm. And he just said to me, listen, you know, one day you're going to make it. I strongly believe you're going to make it. Just pay forward. Yeah. So over the years, I can't tell you how many people have, you know, have help. You know, mm. I never asked to be mentioned or talked about, but just, just do it. And I knew Brad wanted to go to Russia. I was like, Brad, I, I, I take care of you to go. Mm. You know, that, but that's just, just, you know, I can't, if I tell you how many people I've done that for, you probably think I'm crazy. <laughs> <laughs> no, that's great. That's great to hear. Cause I like to hear, like, say with me, what I've done with the media, I've had people like Peter McGough, Kevin Horton, you know, these people have really helped me to get a foot, you know, and they, they that's both, they both said that they said, look, which we, we've had a lot of opportunity and a lot of experience and we believe in paying it forward to the kind of the next generation coming up like you've done with Cebu and uh, and Brad and you know I think that's really um I think it's real good it's a really good example you're setting there I think it's really it's wonderful to do I just feel as if nobody get nobody makes it on their own I don't care who you are it's somewhere along the somewhere along the line yeah somebody um lend a helping hand mm -hmm. and Sometimes people forget that. Yeah. When they get to the finish line, it's like, I did it on myself. Yeah. And they didn't. And they did. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. And we fit, yeah, I've experienced <clears throat> that many times. Yeah. Okay, so obviously in part one, we, we, we went right from 2010 when he turned pro at the North Americans right up to the 2017 Olympia where I actually said, yep, he's on the slide. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, and, and I'd like to point out how wrong I was because that leads us up nicely to 2018 where, uh, yeah, tell us about 2018. I mean, like, we, we spoke about the Arnold, which you had to pull out where you said you were looking your best ever, which was obviously you had the other you know, bleeding ulcer and all that. Tell us about, obviously, the um, a bit of a pivotal, <laughs> bit, bit of a memorable year for you, the 2018 Olympia. Just tell us about the whole lead up and the whole build up and trying to 
you know, because you, you kind of slipped the year before with the broken jaw, which you didn't really talk about. And then you came, and I'll be honest, you were not on anyone's radar. And you'd been second in the Olympia, you'd been third in the Olympia. And I think people had just kind of just started to thought, um, people like myself thought you were kind of on the tail end. And then obviously you came back and you did something that was quite one of the most, it's one of the most astonishing things I think I've ever seen, actually. It really is. Sorry about that. Well, you know, 2018, after leading an officer and all that, mm. I thought about quitting. Not because of bodybuilding and feeling as if I was declining, but, you know, after the whole bleeding ulcer, it was like, man, I got my daughter to worry about. Mm. You know, do I really want to do this? You know, it's a sacrifice worth the reward. You know, there was a lot of stuff that you know, kind of went through my mind and it's hard because like I love bodybuilding. It's been in my life, my entire life. And now I'm like, I, I remember saying to Chris, I just can't get out of neutral. <laughs> it's like, I just, you know, sending pictures to Chris and I was like, I just, I'm, just, I'm, I'm going to the motion. I'm so going to the motion. When just, would what say what month of 2018 would that have been? This happened all the way up until the end of June. What? <laughs> so what? Um, okay, that's a pretty big turnaround. There had to be a something that turned you around to take you from neutral and put you into sixth gear. What was it? <clears throat> One second. Can I? I need to grab a cough medicine. Go on then. Go on. We'll let it. Okay. We'll let it. We're back after a commercial break. <laughs> yep, you've been up. Get some cookies. I should have went to get some cookies. Yep. <clears throat> no, but um, it was. I, I couldn't get out of neutral. Hmm. I kept saying, "Man, like, I don't know, Chris. I don't know, Chris. Go just keep sending me pictures." What happened was my, my family was going to Hawaii. Mm -hmm. And um, Chris was like, just go. And I'm like, are you sure? He's like, yeah, just go. And he goes, I'm going to send you a diet. That was simple. <laughs> Eat <Yeah>. fish. <laughs> just fish. <clears throat> just fish. Mm -hmm. And... I was like, okay, but I could, it was like, I came back from, I was in Hawaii and I text Chris and I said, okay, I think I'm ready. And I cut my vacation start, um, short. Okay. Back. So what, what was the, what was, what was the switch in your mind that made <clears throat> you cut your holiday short and say, right, okay, I'm going for the Olympia. I stopped fighting myself. In what way? I think I was so caught up in Oster oh, Olympia, it's Olympia, it's Olympia. Hmm. And I needed to just be like, man, you know what? Yes, it's the Olympia. You've done this before. Hmm. You know what you need to do. Just go train, enjoy yourself. And that's what I ended up doing. What I want to know is, you brought such a different look to that Olympia. <clears throat> I, I, I don't. What changed? Was it? Did he? Did Chris bring you in lighter? Did he prep you longer? Did you train differently? What was <clears throat> it? Because you look so good. I stopped caring. <laughs> okay. I let everything go. Mm -hmm. And I just said, I'm going to enjoy myself. Yeah. But in the back of my mind, I told myself, I am not leaving Vegas without the sand now. Oh, really? I, 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 wanted, I wanted it that bad. Yeah. That I was like, if I didn't win it, I'm going to seal it. Yeah. <laughs> so 
did you feel more confident going in? Because you obviously the year before you'd had the challenge with the jaw, with the Arnold, you know, obviously that was out the way. Did, did you just feel more confident knowing you had nothing restricting you this time? I told myself I had nothing to lose. <laughs> yeah. It was like, you know, I'm all in, whatever it takes. Like, I'm not leaving Vegas without it. So, so at what point <clears throat> did you feel really confident that you were going to take it? At what point? Was it in the lead up to the show or was it at some point in the judging? When was it? Because I've, I've spoke to this about other athletes and they said, oh, and I, this, when this happened, I knew I had it. When did you know? When they announced my name. <laughs> oh, wow. Really? Yeah. Really? Not I mean, even not even in the pre-judging when they they were moving you around. Did you think, oh, this is because they the judges signal, don't they? They signal to the to the crowd, and they by by how they move you around that they they've got their eye on someone to win the show. Yeah, when they call my name. <laughs> <laughs> 